How many times have you heard someone say they want to make a better world? It is a noble sentiment, but very hard to achieve, right? Well, actually, it's quite easy. All we have to do is increase just one human trait. This trait is so powerful that it alone can make people happier without working on their happiness and make them better, and by better I mean more generous, more honest, more kind, more everything good, without a single lesson in morality. So then, what is this one almost magical thing? Drum roll, please. It's gratitude. You can't be a happy person if you aren't grateful, and you can't be a good person if you aren't grateful. Almost everything good flows from gratitude, and almost everything bad flows from ingratitude. Let's begin with ingratitude. Here's a rule of life. Ingratitude guarantees unhappiness. It is as simple as that. There isn't an ungrateful, happy person on earth. And there isn't an ungrateful, good person on earth. There are two reasons. Reason one is victimhood. Ingratitude always leads to, or comes from, victimhood. Ungrateful people, by definition, think of themselves as victims. And perceiving oneself as a victim, or perceiving oneself as a member of a victim group, may be the single biggest reason people hurt other people, from hurtful comments to mass murder. People who think of themselves as victims tend to believe that because they've been hurt by others, they can hurt others. And the second reason ungrateful people aren't good people is that ingratitude is always accompanied by anger. The ungrateful are angry, and angry people lash out at others. If ingratitude makes people unhappy and mean, then gratitude must make people happy and kind. And so it does. Think of the times you have felt most grateful. Were they not always accompanied by a feeling of happiness? Weren't they also accompanied by a desire to be kinder to other people? The answer, of course, is yes. Grateful people aren't angry, and they don't see themselves as victims. The problem, however, and it's a big one, is that in America and much of the rest of the world, people are becoming less grateful. Why? Because people are constantly told that they are entitled to things they haven't earned what are known as benefits or entitlements. And the more things that people think they should get, the less grateful they will be for whatever they do get. And the more angry and therefore unhappy they will be when they don't get them. Here are two rules of life. Rule number one, the less you feel entitled to, the more gratitude you will feel for whatever you get and the happier you will be. Rule number two, the more you feel entitled to, the less happy you will be. That's why, for example, children who get whatever they want are usually less happy children. Uh. We have a word for such children, spoiled. And no one thinks of a spoiled child as a happy child, and certainly not a kind one. The more that you feel that life or society owes you, the angrier you will get the less happy you will be. As a result, we are increasing the number of angry, unhappy, and selfish people. The other way we are making people unhappy, and even meaner, is by cultivating a sense of victimhood. People are constantly told that they are victims because of their upbringing, because of past prejudice against their group, because of material inequality, because they are female, and for many other reasons. Next time you want to assess any social policy, ask this question first. Will this policy increase or decrease gratitude among people? You will then know whether it is something that will bring more goodness and happiness to the world or less. If I were granted one wish, it would be that all people be grateful. Gratitude is the source of happiness and the source of goodness. And the more good people and the more happy people there are walking around, the happier and better our world will be. If you have a way of achieving such a world, 
without increasing gratitude? Let me know what it is. I'm Dennis Prager. Once upon a time, there were three brothers, triplets, named Tom, Dick, and Harry Class. They were raised in the same home with the same parents, had the same IQ, same skills, and same opportunities. Each was married and had two children. They were all carpenters making $25 per hour. While they were very similar in all these respects, they had different priorities. For example, Tom chose to work 20 hours per week, while his brother Dick worked 40 hours, and Harry, 60. It should also be noted that Harry's wife worked full-time as an office manager for a salary of $50,000. Dick's wife sold real estate part-time 10 hours a week and made $25,000 per year. Tom's wife did not work. Tom and Dick spent all of their family income. Since they paid into Social Security, they figured they didn't need to save for retirement. Harry and his wife, on the other hand, had, over many years, put away money each month and invested it in stocks and bonds. Here's how it worked out. Tom made $25,000 a year. Dick and his wife made $75,000. And Harry and his wife, $150,000. When a new housing development opened up in their community, the brothers decided to buy equally priced homes on the same private street. One day, the brothers decided to pool their funds for the purpose of improving their street, concerned about crime and safety, and wanting a more attractive setting for their homes, the three families decided to install a security gate at the street's entrance, repave the street's surface, and enhance the lighting and landscaping. The work was done for a total cost of $30,000. Harry assumed they would divide the bill three ways, each brother paying $10,000. But Tom and Dick objected. Hmm. Why should we pay the same as you? They said, you make much more money than we do. Harry was puzzled. What does that have to do with anything, he asked. My family makes more money because my wife and I work long hours and because we have saved some of the money we've earned to make additional money from investments. Why should we be penalized for that? Harry, you can work and save all you like, Tom countered. But my wife and I want to enjoy ourselves now, not 25 years from now. Fine, Tom, do what you want. It's a free country. But why should I have to pay for that? I can't believe you're being so unbrotherly, Tom argued. You have a lot of money and I don't. I thought you'd be more generous. Hmm. At this point, Dick, the peacemaker in the family, entered the conversation. I've got an idea, Dick said. Our combined income is $250,000, and $30,000 is 12% of that amount. Why don't we each pay that percentage of our income? Under that formula, Tom would pay $3,000, I would pay $9,000, and Harry would pay $18,000. I have a much better idea, said Tom, and one that's fairer than what you're proposing. Dick and Harry turned to Tom. Harry should pay $23,450. Dick, you should pay $6,550. And I will pay nothing. To Dick, this sounded completely arbitrary and not really fair, but it did have one big plus. His share would be $2,450 less under Tom's formula than under his own. So he decided to be silent. Harry, however, was stunned. You want me to pay almost 80% of the bill despite the fact that each of us is receiving the exact same benefits? Where did you get such a crazy idea? From no less an authority than the U.S. government, Tom responded as he pulled out a gray booklet. It's all right here in the IRS tax tables. This is the progressive income tax system all U.S. taxpayers live under, and I don't see why we should be any different. In fact, I believe all future improvements should be paid in this way. Works for me, said Dick. So, by a vote of two to one, the cost of the street improvements was divided as Tom had proposed, even though they benefited equally, and even though the reason Harry had more money was that he and his wife had worked many more hours than his brothers and their wives, and had saved some of what they had earned, instead of spending it all. Tom and Dick lived happily ever after with their new arrangement. Harry grumbled a lot, but whenever he complained, his brothers called him greedy, and selfish. The end. Oh.
I want to talk to you about the Electoral College and why it matters. All right, I know this doesn't sound like the most sensational topic of the day, but stay with me because I promise you it's one of the most important. To explain why requires a very brief civics review. The President and Vice President of the United States are not chosen by a nationwide popular vote of the American people. Rather, they are chosen by 538 electors. This process is spelled out in the United States Constitution. Why didn't the founders just make it easy and let the presidential candidate with the most votes claim victory? Why did they create, and why do we continue to need this electoral college? The answer is critical to understanding not only the electoral college, but also America. The founders had no intention of creating a pure majority rule democracy. They knew from careful study of history what most have forgotten today or never learned. Pure democracies do not work. They implode. Democracy has been colorfully described as two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. In a pure democracy, bare majorities can easily tyrannize the rest of a country. The founders wanted to avoid this at all costs. This is why we have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. It's why each state has two senators, no matter what its population, but also different numbers of representatives based entirely on population. It's why it takes a supermajority in Congress and three quarters of the states to change the Constitution. And it's why we have the Electoral College. Here's how the Electoral College works. The presidential election happens in two phases. The first phase is purely democratic. We hold 51 popular elections every presidential election year, one in each state and one in D.C. On election day in 2012, you may have thought you were voting for Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, but you were really voting for a slate of presidential electors. In Rhode Island, for example, if you voted for Barack Obama, you voted for the state's four Democratic electors. If you voted for Mitt Romney, you are really voting for the state's four Republican electors. Part two of the election is held in December, and it is this December election among the state's 538 electors, not the November election, which officially determines the identity of the next president. At least 270 votes are needed to win. Why is this so important? Because the system encourages coalition building and national campaigning. In order to win, a candidate must have the support of many different types of voters from various parts of the country. Winning only the South or the Midwest is not good enough. You cannot win 270 electoral votes if only one part of the country is supporting you. But if winning were only about getting the most votes, a candidate might concentrate all of his efforts in the biggest cities or the biggest states. Why would that candidate care about what people in West Virginia or Iowa or Montana think? But, you might ask, isn't the election really only about the so-called swing states? Actually, no. If nothing else, safe and swing states are constantly changing. California voted safely Republican as recently as 1988. Texas used to vote Democrat. Neither New Hampshire nor Virginia used to be swing states. Most people think that George W. Bush won the 2000 election because of Florida. Well, sort of. But he really won the election because he managed to flip one state which the Democrats thought was safe, West Virginia. Its four electoral votes turned out to be decisive. No political party can ignore any state for too long without suffering the consequences. Every state, and therefore every voter in every state, is important. The Electoral College also makes it harder to steal elections. Votes must be stolen in the right state in order to change the outcome of the Electoral College. With so many swing states, this is hard to predict and hard to do. But without the Electoral College, any vote stolen in any precinct in the country could affect the national outcome, even if that vote was easily stolen in the bluest California precinct or the reddest Texas one. The Electoral College is an ingenious method of selecting a president for a great, diverse republic such as our own. It protects against the tyranny of the majority, encourages coalition building, and discourages voter fraud. Our founders were proud of it. We can be too. I'm Tara Ross for Prager University. Participation trophies. I'm not a fan. They're bad for kids, bad for parents, 
bad for society. Other than that, they're okay. Don't get me wrong. I love any kind of organized competition for kids. I lived and breathed baseball, basketball, football, and soccer growing up. If there was a sport to be played, I played it. And never once did anybody ever tell me that winning was not important or that showing up was all that mattered. But today, kids get a different message. Losing, no big deal. Showing up, that deserves a trophy. Wow, what an awful thing to tell a kid. Glad my parents or coaches never said it to me. If they had, I'm sure I never would have become a pro soccer player. Let me tell you why. In high school, I was a good soccer player. I thought I could play soccer in college. Looking back though, I just wasn't good enough in those college coaches' eyes. I tried out for the UCLA team as a walk-on. I made it, I was vindicated. I had arrived on the bench. The coach hardly ever looked at me. I'm not even sure he knew my name. I know he didn't care about my feelings. I wanted to be a starter. I wanted to be a winner. Shouldn't I have been satisfied just for making the team? Of course not. That's absurd. But isn't that what kids are told today? You're a winner, even if you're not. Even if you come in last and we'll give you a trophy just for showing up, just for participating. This belief that showing up is an accomplishment is self-destructive because the pain of losing is part of what drives one to improve. The frustration of going to game after game and sitting on the bench drove me nuts. I had to practice more. I had to work harder. Or I had to give up. And I didn't want to give up. This taught me an important lesson. If you don't put in the work, you won't get ahead. And not getting ahead, well, that feels awful. So put in the work or go home. So I put in the work. I pushed myself not to do my best because who can possibly know what their best is, but to be better and better. And one day my chance came. Coach put me in the game, not because I wanted so badly to play, but because he needed me. I played well, well enough to start the next game where I scored a goal and had an assist. After that, I started every game. The road to victory in sports, in business, in life, is paved with losses, painful losses, losses that can hurt so much it's hard to breathe. Any professional athlete or successful entrepreneur will tell you that's true. But participation trophies, everybody is the valedictorian, and let's all pat each other on the back awards communicate a different message. They tell you that losing doesn't matter, it matters. They tell you that competition is, at best, not important, and at worst, dangerous. I wonder how my soccer career would have turned out if I'd grown up with these ideas in my head. I was cut twice during the tryout period for the 1992 Olympics. My pro soccer team, the LA Galaxy, lost three times in the championship before we finally won in 2002. Guess what? I survived all these disappointments and a whole lot more they only made victory that much sweeter. In the real world, you're rewarded for achievement, not effort. Promotions don't go to the employees who did their best, they go to the employees who did the best. But what if the kids can't handle losing? What if it's too painful? That's the whole point. It's your job as the adult, as the parent, to help them understand that losing, that not getting what they want, is a part of life. Nobody likes to fail, but it's inevitable, and it's the only path ultimately to success. Yes, showing up and participating is important. Trying your best is important, but neither deserves a trophy. If you want one of those, go win something. I'm Kobe Jones for Prager University. Ideas have consequences, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and sometimes catastrophic, like the ideas of Karl Marx. Born in Trier, Germany in 1818, Marx didn't invent communism, but it was on his ideas that Lenin and Stalin built the Soviet Union, Mao built communist China, 
and innumerable other tyrants from the Kims in North Korea to the Castros in Cuba built their communist regimes. Ultimately, those regimes and movements calling themselves Marxist murdered about 100 million people and enslaved more than a billion. Marx believed that workers, specifically those who did manual labor, were exploited by capitalists, the people who owned, as Marx put it, the means of production, specifically factories, but who did very little physical labor themselves. Only a workers' revolution, Marx wrote in Das Kapital, could correct this injustice. What would that revolution look like? Marx and his collaborator, Friedrich Engels, spelled it out point by point in the Communist Manifesto. It included the abolition of property and inheritance and the centralization of credit, communication, and transport in the hands of the state, and a lot more along the same lines. In other words, the state owns and controls pretty much everything. This notion was widely discussed and debated in European intellectual circles during Marx's lifetime, but nothing much came of it until Vladimir Lenin took power in Russia in 1917. This changed everything. Despite its repeated economic failures, Lenin's Russia, which became known as the Soviet Union, became the model for dictators around the world. Wherever Marx's ideas were practiced, life got worse. Not by a little, but by a lot. There is not a single exception to this rule. Not the Soviet Union, not Eastern Europe, not China, not North Korea, not Vietnam, not Cuba, not Venezuela, not Bolivia, not Zimbabwe. Wherever Marxism goes, economic collapse, terror, and famine follow. So if cataclysmic failure, meaning terrible human suffering, is the inevitable legacy of Marxism, why do so many people, and now especially young people, defend it? The most common answer Marxism's advocates offer is that they, whoever they are, Lenin, Stalin, Chavez, never really practiced Marxism. They all somehow got it wrong. Marxism, we are told, is, at its essence, about sharing what we have, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, as Marx put it. Maybe that sounds good to you, but what does it mean? Who determines ability? Who determines need? The answer is the state, the ruling elite. Under Marxism, that's who has all the power. That's why the truth is this. Marxist dictators like Lenin, Mao, and Pol Pot really did get Marxism right. They wanted absolute power, and Marxism gave them the way to get it. Karl Marx never had to face the consequences of his theories. He lived most of his adult life breathing the free air of London, England, living off the generosity of his collaborator and patron, Ingalls, who, as it happens, inherited his money from his wealthy merchant father. Marx spent his days in the reading room of the British Museum, researching and writing. Although he was obsessed with the term scientific, he was never able to marshal data to prove his theories. There's a good reason for this. There was no data to prove his theories. For all his time in the library, Marx couldn't find any evidence to suggest that capitalism, the free exchange of goods and services through privately owned business, was a passing phase. Throughout the industrial age, working conditions constantly improved and wealth expanded. Marx had to rely on outdated reports to make his case. And even then, he had to manipulate the data to get it to conform to his predetermined theories. But Marx really had no interest in proving his theories. He knew that they could be put into practice only by brute force. He said so himself. Of course, in the beginning, communism cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads, he wrote. His ends could be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. All existing social conditions. That's religion, family, personal possessions, freedom, and democracy. They all had to go in order to achieve Marx's vision of an earthly paradise. But since few people give up their liberties and property voluntarily, creating a Marxist state has always required guns, prisons, and summary executions. Marx's many disciples from Lenin on never considered this a problem. Some, like revolutionary poster boy Che Guevara, considered it a bonus. I don't need proof to execute a man, Che is said to have boasted. I only need proof that it's necessary to execute him. If you're still a fan of Marxism after all the death, suffering, and destruction it's caused, that's your right. But own up to it. Don't hide behind the, it's never really been tried line. It has. I'm Paul Kengor, professor of political science at Grove City College for Prager University. I... I'm an anti-feminist. 
Feminism is a mean-spirited, small-minded, and oppressive philosophy that can poison relations between the sexes. Relations which, for most of us, provide some of life's deepest pleasures and consolations. Feminism has attempted to bully us all into accepting an obvious lie. The lie that men and women have the same powers, talents, proclivities, and desires, and that consequently, any discrepancy in their professional paths is due to bigotry and must be corrected by force of culture and law. By shoving that lie down our throats, feminism has made both men and women less happy and less free. Now, I'm going to have to speak in generalities, and I understand there are all kinds of exceptions to what I'm about to say. But the generalities remain generally valid. Feminism denigrates masculinity in men by relentlessly calling us toxic for our flaws rather than appreciating our natural qualities of energy, risk-taking, and leadership. But it also denigrates femininity in women, working to replace most women's commitment to relationship and child-rearing with male obsessions, such as career status and strength. What's the result? Take a look at the quintessential feminist icon, Rosie the Riveter, flexing her muscle. The truth is, any man of the same size and fitness can make a bigger, stronger muscle than Rosie can. By herding women away from their feminine natures, feminism seeks to transform them from first-rate women into second-rate men. Now, perhaps you'll protest. Isn't feminism simply the idea that women have the same human rights as men? No, it isn't. That philosophy is called classical liberalism, which holds that we are all equally endowed by God with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But wait, doesn't the Declaration of Independence say that all men are created equal? Yes, classical liberalism was an idea conceived by, and largely for, Christian white men. But, like all ideas, good and bad, classical liberalism has evolved over time according to its internal logic, so it now includes all races and both sexes. Good job, Christian white men. Thanks for the great idea. As its excuse for the damage it does to our lives, feminism has developed the historical mythology that men have oppressed women and now must be suppressed in their turn to even things out. Let me propose a different narrative that has the advantage of possibly being true. Insofar as men and women are physical creations, their central purpose is the production of more human beings. Women are therefore fashioned in body and mind to make and nurture children, and men to protect and support those children during their relatively long maturation period. All societies shape themselves around these necessities. They created structures that formalized gender roles and attempted to ensure the paternity of children so that men would care for their own. In many societies, these structures became increasingly ritualistic and oppressive for women. But the opposite happened in the Christian West. Why? Take a look at your Bible, Proverbs 31. The biblical ideal of a good woman is not only strong, kind, and wise, she's also a creative and economic dynamo. Christianity sanctified motherhood in the person of Mary and celebrated women's fortitude and virtue in the female saints. The Church created a version of marriage intended to protect women and designed the philosophy of chivalry, which instructed men to use their superior strength for women, not against them. Individuals can be incredibly abusive to one another, men and women both. But over time, Christendom tended to elevate, protect, and ultimately include women as women in the great enterprise of Western civilization. Now, the developments of modernity have created special challenges for women. Industry removed clothing and food production from the home to the factory and thus deprived homemakers of their traditional businesses. Children lost their monetary value to parents by leaving home to fend for themselves. So, while motherhood and homemaking remain the most important spiritual activities of humankind, modernity has stripped those enterprises of their former economic power. But, in a Western civilization dedicated to equal rights, these challenges come along with fresh opportunities. New technologies and effective birth control allow individual women to tailor gender roles to their personal liking or abandon them altogether. None of this is a reason to attack men. In fact, these new opportunities are largely the result of men's inventions and their ideas. And none of it requires women to abandon the femininity which is one of the graces of our world. It's just change and progress, that's all. With honest thought and goodwill, we can adapt over time 
without the angry, bitter, and dishonest attacks on our human nature by feminists. I'm Andrew Claven for Prager University. Thanksgiving, Independence Day, Memorial Day, holidays are a great time to riddle Americans with needless oppressive guilt. But the one that stands head and shoulders above the rest is Columbus Day. The day where progressives indoctrinate your children into believing Columbus to be Satan incarnate, the USA to be his evil spawn, and the Native Americans to be pacifists. And so now we have Indigenous Peoples Day, or as it would have been named 30 years ago, Aboriginals Day, or as it would have been named 10 or 15 years ago, Native Americans Day, or as it could be named tomorrow in Canada, First Nation Peoples Day. Feeling the urge to self-inflict grievous bodily harm yet? That's only natural because the whole charade has become an exercise in hating Western civilization, which is really just an exercise in hating yourself. First, as far as Columbus goes, the guy deserves some credit, right? Flawed, to be sure, but he was the greatest navigator of his age, the first person to cross the Atlantic from the continent of Europe, and he did so without any maps and only three small ships. If you can name them, by the way, comment below, as I'm sure your professor can't. But your professor probably has taught you the tale of Columbus as a villain usually as a starting off point to indict the United States as a whole, often relying on a few key myths and some pivotal lies by omission. So to start with, I'll bet that you probably believe Columbus and other European settlers to simply have committed mass genocide against Native Americans, sorry, indigenous. But here's the truth. While there were many examples of brutal warfare between Europeans and Native Americans, neither side actually committed genocide. In fact, there was never an outright policy of Indian extermination. The Native Americans were mostly wiped out through infectious diseases that the settlers had inadvertently brought with them. Of the estimated 250,000 natives in Hispaniola, Columbus's first stop in the Americas in 1492, new infectious diseases wiped out a staggering 95% of their population by 1517. As far as genocide by violence, you can look at any historical account of even the most one-sided battles and find that they were still just that, battles. Take Wounded Knee, although hundreds of years later, I only bring it up because I know that if I don't, you will. It's become ubiquitous with the idea of Native American genocide. After all, there were 150 to 350 aboriginals killed or wounded. That's terrible. But there were also 25 American soldiers killed and 39 wounded. That's not genocide. That's a one-sided beatdown with old glory wielding the hammer. And sometimes the massacres went the other direction. See the Apaches for reference, or the Comanches, or a dozen or so other tribes. So the natives often gave as good as they got. Not exactly the way genocide usually tends to work. Here's another thing I bet you've been made to believe. That many Native Americans, sorry American Indians, sorry I don't know what, take your pick, lived in harmony with the environment until Columbus arrived and European settlers destroyed the land with their evil technology. Truth, not only did the natives brutally take out people, but they took out entire forests and hunted species to extinction. Squatting Bear and his First Nation buddies weren't hopping into kayaks to block whaling ships, probably because they were too busy killing seals to waterproof their kayaks. You also probably believe that the Native American, sorry, two-spirited First Nation something or other culture was a beautiful, pantheistic one of peace. The truth is, not so much. When Columbus arrived, the islands were inhabited by two main tribes. The Arawaks, who were passive and friendly, and the Caribs, who were vicious cannibals. The Arawaks actually lived in fear of the Caribs for, you guessed it, the reasons being that they hunted them down to enslave them and eat them. Yes, eat them. Ironically, we get the name Caribbean Islands from those famous people eaters. The only way settlers were able to conquer this land was through the help of Native Americans who teamed up with them to settle the score with other tribes who were even bigger jerks than they were. That's not even to mention the populations in Central and South America famous for ritual human sacrifice. You think Cortez was able to command and conquer with only 500 or so conquistadors? Of course not. It took 50,000 screaming, angry allied natives who'd had it up to here with being tortured, enslaved, and forced to carry gold for the other native Aztecs. At some point, they decided to roll the dice and go with the guy sporting funny beards and metal hats. None of this is to say that the early settlers were perfect, or that they didn't carry out their fair share of pretty scummy stuff, but to use America's mistakes as the brush with which to paint the entirety of its history while completely ignoring the indigenous lifestyle of barbarism and borderline evil is inaccurate at best, dishonest at worst. There were plenty of bloody, horrendous battles between the Europeans and the Indians. When a Neolithic tribe encounters a more technologically advanced people, the guys with the boom boom sticks usually win. Columbus is not the issue here and never was. This whole Indigenous Peoples Day charade is about teaching your children to despise Western civilization and anybody who dare defend it. But 
And again, that could just be my Western civ privilege talking. Happy Columbus Day. I'm Steven Crowder for Prager University. It's very easy for a politician to stand up before voters and say, health care is a right, and then passionately advocate for single payer or free health care or Medicare for all, whatever term they might use. But before we consider the merits of the government managing your health care, and that's what this all boils down to, maybe we should ask a more basic question. What do we mean by health care? Because if you get sick, and here we're talking major illness or you're in serious pain, you don't just want health care. You want quality health care. And where is your best chance of finding that? The answer is right here in America. For skilled doctors, cutting-edge medical treatments, and care without long delays, no other country rivals the United States. Not even close. Nobody from Texas is going to Canada for medical treatment. It's almost always the other way around. Sure, our health care system has lots of issues, and we should address them. But do we really want to upend all the advantages that we do have and start from scratch? because that's what would have to happen if we completely turn healthcare over to the government. So let's imagine we make the change. We hear a lot about how great free healthcare would be, but it's only fair we look at the downside. The first is that government-run healthcare takes medical decisions away from patients, that means you, and puts them in the hands of bureaucrats. They decide, for example, how many MRI machines are going to be available, or under what conditions you can get back surgery or a bypass, or even whether you qualify for cancer treatment. That's how it works in the United Kingdom under its single-payer system. Because it has finite resources, the National Health Service, or NHS, sharply restricts access to treatments like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery, and even prescription drugs to deal with common conditions like arthritis and diabetes. If you suffer from any of these ailments and many others in the UK, you may just have to live with the pain. And let's hope you don't have a medical emergency. In a January 2018 article in the New York Times, patients in emergency rooms around London are described as having to wait 12 hours before they are tended to. Corridors are jammed with beds carrying the frail and elderly. To deal with the situation, hospitals were ordered to postpone non-urgent surgeries until the end of the month. That hardly seems like an improvement over what we have in the US. A second big problem with single-payer systems is that they are expensive, really expensive. A recent study by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University found that a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All health system would cost a tidy $32.6 trillion over 10 years. That's on top of what the federal government spends on health care today. And this is not a new number. Other studies have found the cost to be roughly in the same range. So how would we pay for it? Kenneth Thorpe, a professor at Emory University and health policy official in the Clinton administration, spells it out. If you are going to go in this direction, Medicare for all, the tax increases are going to be enormous. Not just for the rich, Thorpe estimates, but for working Americans and the poor too. Charles Blahaus, the author of the Mercatus study, puts it this way, even a doubling of all projected individual and corporate income taxes would be insufficient to finance these added federal costs. And he considers that a conservative estimate. Canada knows all about exploding healthcare costs. In Ontario, the country's biggest province, those costs took up 46% of its entire budget in 2010. By 2030, that number is projected to be 80%. In other words, in a few years, Ontario will have little money to pay for anything except health care. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, government-run systems depress the search for new cures. Biomedical research spending in the U.S. far outpaces that of any country with nationalized health care, even when you account for differences in population or size of economies. That's one reason medical breakthroughs rarely come from countries where the government controls health care. They come from the United States, where the government doesn't. The lion's share of biomedical research and development spending in the U.S., over $70 billion in 2012, comes from the private sector. Discovering new medical cures and technology is a profitable business, and thank goodness it is. Those profits drive innovation. Take away the profits, and you will surely take away the innovation. Single payer, free health care, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. I'm Lan He Chen, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University.
Race and ethnicity have defined every nation on Earth, except one, the United States of America. It is defined by values. So to understand America, you have to understand American values. They are 1. E pluribus unum, 2. Liberty, 3. In God We Trust. I call this the American Trinity. I made up the name, but I didn't make up the values. They are on every American coin. The first, E pluribus unum, is Latin, meaning out of many, one. When first adopted as an American motto, shortly after the American founding in 1776, it referred to the 13 American colonies becoming one nation. Over time, however, most Americans understood the motto to mean one people from many backgrounds. To quote the E Pluribus Unum Project, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, over the years, E Pluribus Unum has also served as a reminder of America's bold attempt to make one unified nation of people from many different backgrounds and beliefs. In other words, America doesn't care about your national or ethnic origins. This explains why people who immigrate to America assimilate faster and more fully than immigrants to any other country. Most of those who have immigrated to Europe from, for example, Turkey, as millions have, are not considered fully German by fellow Germans or fully Swedish by fellow Swedes or fully Spanish by fellow Spaniards. This is even true of the children and grandchildren of those immigrants. And just as important, few of those immigrants or their children or grandchildren will ever feel fully German, Swedish, or Spanish. But a Turk who immigrates to the United States will be regarded as fully American, as American as any other American, the moment he or she becomes a citizen. And they, and certainly their children, will feel fully American. Of course, America has not always lived up to this e pluribus unum ideal, but the ideal was always there, and it was applied to virtually every immigrant to America. The second component of the American Trinity is liberty. Now you might ask, didn't the French Revolution also enshrine liberty as a central national value? Wasn't its motto liberty, equality, fraternity? The answer is yes. America is hardly the only country to enshrine liberty. It is the only country to enshrine liberty, e pluribus unum, and in God we trust. What's the difference? The difference is this. The moment you affirm equality, as the French Revolution did, you will lose liberty. It is a basic American value that all human beings are born equal and all must be equal before the law. But ending up equal, that's a French and European value. And if you want people to end up equal, you must deprive them of liberty which is exactly what happened right after the French Revolution and in every other society that made equality its national goal. America gives people the liberty to end up wherever their abilities, work ethic, and luck take them, meaning unequal. Therefore, professional athletes will make more money than teachers or doctors. That may be unfortunate, but that is what liberty allows. If you want equality, you will tell people how much they can earn and that means the end of liberty. And third, in God we trust. Unlike almost every other country, America never had a state religion. But it was founded on the principle that God, specifically the God of the Bible, is the source of moral values. As the Declaration of Independence put it, all people are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, Rights come from God, not from men. If rights are given by men, men can take them away. The American Trinity is the reason America became the world's freest and most prosperous country. But many Americans want to, in the words of former President Barack Obama, fundamentally transform it. They wish to replace American values with European values. Equality of result and an ever-expanding state which greatly reduce individual freedom, the celebration of ethnic and racial identity, which is the opposite of e pluribus unum, and the removal of God as the source of morality and rights. Which set of values Americans adopt will determine whether America remains free, prosperous, 
and the force for good in the world that it has been. With the exception of the Civil War, this is the greatest internal battle in American history. I'm Dennis Prager. I recently watched a group of protesters, most of them young, denouncing President Donald Trump's immigration policies. They were waving Mexican flags and shouting, Si se puede! Yes, we can. This is now the rallying cry of the open borders left, but it wasn't always. In fact, I wondered if a single person at the protest knew where it came from. The slogan first became famous 50 years ago, thanks to Cesar Chavez. He was the founder of the United Farm Workers Union. When Chavez said, si se puede, he meant something very different. Yes, we can seal the borders. Cesar Chavez hated illegal immigration. He was Hispanic, obviously, and definitely on the left, but he fought to keep illegal Mexican immigrants out of this country. He understood that peasants from Latin America will always work for less than Americans will. That's why employers prefer them. Chavez knew that. As long as we have a poor country bordering California, he once explained, it's going to be very difficult to win strikes. In 1969, Chavez led a march down the center of California to protest the hiring of illegal immigrant produce pickers. Marching alongside him was Democratic Senator Walter Mondale and the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the longtime aide to Martin Luther King. Ten years later, Chavez dispatched armed union members into the desert to assault Mexican nationals who were trying to sneak across the border. Chavez's men beat immigrants with chains and whips made of barbed wire. Illegal aliens who dared to work as scabs had their houses firebombed and their cars burned. Chavez wasn't embarrassed about any of this. He bragged about it. No matter. Chavez remains a progressive hero. President Obama declared his birthday a commemorative federal holiday. It's an official day off in a half a dozen states. There's a college named after him and dozens of public schools. Cesar Chavez's life is a reminder of how much the left has changed and how quickly. Until recently, most Democrats agreed with Chavez. They opposed unchecked immigration because they knew it hurt American workers, and they were right. One study by a Harvard economist examined the effects of the mass migration of Cuban refugees to this country in 1980, the so-called Mariel Boatlift. He found that American workers in Miami with a high school education saw their wages fall by more than 30% after the refugees arrived. If you believe in supply and demand, this is not surprising. After the fall of Saigon in 1975, Democratic Governor Jerry Brown opposed letting Vietnamese refugees into California on the grounds that the state already had enough poor people. As he put it at the time, there's something a little strange about saying, let's bring in 500,000 more people when we can't take care of the 1 million Californians out of work. First-term Senator Joe Biden of Delaware agreed. He introduced federal legislation to curb the arrival of the Vietnamese. Two decades later, leading Democrats were still wary of mass immigration, especially illegal immigration. As Bill Clinton put it in the 1995 State of the Union address, Americans are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public services they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. No prominent Democrat would say anything like that today without being denounced as a racist. Clinton got a standing ovation. As late as 2006, there were still liberals who cared about the economic effects of immigration, legal or illegal. Immigration reduces the wages of domestic workers who compete with immigrants, explained economist Paul Krugman in the New York Times. We'll need to reduce the inflow of low-skilled immigrants. Mainly that means better controls on illegal immigration. That same year, Senator Hillary Clinton voted for a fence on the Mexican border. So did Barack Obama and Chuck Schumer and 23 other Senate Democrats. Not anymore. 20 years after Bill Clinton told Americans they had the right to be upset about illegal immigration, his wife scolded the country for enforcing border controls. So what changed? Not the economics of it. The law of supply and demand remained in effect. It's not a coincidence that as illegal immigration surged, wages for American workers stagnated. What changed is that Democrats stopped caring about those workers, about the middle class, really. Why? Here's the answer in four simple facts. One, according to a recent study from Yale, there are at least 22 million illegal immigrants living in the United States. Two, Democrats plan to give all of them citizenship. Read the Democrats' 2016 party platform. Three, studies show the overwhelming majority of first-time immigrant voters vote Democrat. Four, the biggest landslide in American presidential history was only 17 million votes. Do the math. The payoff for Democrats? 
permanent electoral majority for the foreseeable future. In a word, power. That's the point, no matter what they tell you. American workers, be damned. I'm Tucker Carlson. It would only be a slight exaggeration to say that Alexander Hamilton invented the United States of America. George Washington was the guiding star, Thomas Jefferson the visionary, Benjamin Franklin the sage. But Hamilton was the pragmatist, the man who got it done. This most self-made of self-made men took a country with no past and planned its future. He was born on January 11, 1755, on the island of Nevis. This was not the Caribbean of your cruise fantasy, quite the contrary. As Ron Chernow writes in his biography of Hamilton, while other founding fathers were reared in tidy New England villages or cosseted on baronial Virginia estates, Hamilton grew up in a tropical hellhole. Sugar plantation slave auctions were a regular feature of island life. The spectacle buyers swinging branding irons as they surveyed the human merchandise made a permanent impression on Hamilton. He was a fierce abolitionist his entire life. Abandoned by his father at an early age, his mother died of yellow fever when he was 14, leaving the teenage boy destitute. A local judge had to buy him shoes so that he could attend her funeral. He soon took a job as a clerk for a local merchant. Before long, he was running the business, coordinating shipments of mules and codfish, calculating currency exchanges, and advising sea captains on how to deal with pirates. It was an unmatchable apprenticeship in trade, credit, and commerce. In 1773, he arrived in New York to attend King's College, the forerunner of today's Columbia University. Swept up in the revolutionary fervor of his adopted country, he dropped out to join the Continental Army. He quickly came to the attention of George Washington, who made him a staff officer. The sonless Washington called the fatherless Hamilton, my boy. Fellow officers later remembered, call Colonel Hamilton, as Washington's instinctive utterance when important news arrived. As Washington's trusted aide, he was involved in every aspect of running the war, including actual fighting where he distinguished himself on multiple occasions. But more than anything, it was his dealings with the weak and indecisive Continental Congress that shaped his political views. The problem with Congress, in Hamilton's view, was that too few members took the idea of nationhood seriously. They quarreled over their narrow interests rather than uniting over the national interests. As the war was winding down, Hamilton laid out the choice before the country in a widely read six-part essay. We could become a noble and magnificent federal republic, he wrote, closely linked in the pursuit of a common interest, or we could stumble ahead as a number of petty states with the appearance only of union. It was clear where Hamilton stood. The speed by which the United States became a unified nation with a cohesive federal government is largely a result of his tireless efforts before, during, and after the Constitutional Convention. Washington named Hamilton, still only 34, to be the first Secretary of the Treasury. He served in the post for almost six years. His task was nothing short of Herculean. Put the country drowning in war debt and teetering on the edge of bankruptcy on a sound financial footing. He succeeded, and in doing so set the course for America to become the world's most prosperous nation. Historian Leonard White writes that Hamilton was not only the greatest administrative genius of his generation, but one of the great administrators of all time. There's no telling what Hamilton might have achieved had he lived a longer life. Instead, he died one of the most pointless deaths in American history. As hard as it is to fathom today, he was killed in a duel with the Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr a man with whom he had a long and bitter political feud. Hamilton fired his pistol harmlessly into the air. He never intended to kill Burr. To Hamilton, it was an affair of honor. But to Burr, it was something else. The vice president took careful aim, shot and mortally wounded his rival, 
who spent some 30 hours in agony before succumbing. Hamilton was 49. Hamilton lived in a time when the great danger to the national project was a government that was too weak. We live in a time when many believe that the great danger to the nation is from a national government grown too strong. The ideal, Hamilton would have told us, is somewhere in between. But perhaps America will have to wait for another Hamilton to achieve that happy medium. I'm Joseph Tartakovsky, Senior Fellow at the Claremont Institute for Prager University. In case you hadn't noticed, life is difficult, complex, and unpredictable. You can't change this. It's the nature of things. But you can prepare yourself for the next unwelcome surprise. How? By building resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from life's inevitable disappointments, failures, and pains. Let me use an analogy here. If cars didn't have shock absorbers, every ride would be a miserable experience. The ride through life without shock absorbers, that is resilience, would be the same. So without building resilience, your own internal shock absorbers, it's not possible to lead a happy and productive life. Resilience is the opposite of fragility. To be fragile means that just about everything upsets you. And if just about everything upsets you, you will spend a lot of time angry and hurt. And if you spend a lot of time angry and hurt, you will not be a happy person. Here, I'm not focusing on severe illness, the death of a loved one, or any crushing life-changing event. In such cases, people usually need help to recover. But for most of us, such situations are rare, while the slights and disappointments of ordinary life are not. And for those, we need resilience. Okay, then. How do you develop resilience? Here are some suggestions to get you started drawn from my 40 plus years as a psychiatrist. First, get some perspective. Step back and assess your situation with as much objectivity as you can. How bad is this problem? Have I overstated it? Sometimes my patients think an unhappy occurrence is much more serious than it really is, usually because it's amplified by evoking a painful childhood issue. Often getting perspective is as simple as asking yourself this question, what's the worst thing that can happen? Usually you'll discover that the worst thing isn't that bad and isn't even likely to happen. Second, compare the undeserved bad things that have happened to you with the unearned good things that have happened to you. When I ask my patients to do this, they invariably conclude that the unearned good in their life far outweighs the undeserved bad. I'd say the ratio is at least 10 to 1. In my own case, I didn't earn the incredibly good fortune of my grandparents moving to America, or that life-saving penicillin was available to me in my childhood when I was sick. I could go on and on, and so could you. In light of this, maybe things aren't so bad after all. In fact, they're probably pretty good. Third, toughen up. Life hits you from all directions. Health personal relationships, work challenges, family issues. To deal with them, you need to build up your mental toughness. The earlier in life one starts this process, the better. That's why parents who coddle their children and protect them from every hurt and failure are not doing them any favors. Nor are colleges that provide students with so-called safe spaces. To toughen up, you need to push yourself. How do you know what you're capable of if you don't do that? I was a sickly child. I saw myself as physically fragile, but the grueling hours in medical school and treating patients with serious illnesses during my residency showed me I was much tougher than I thought. You too probably have more strength than you realize. Find out. Finding that strength will give you resilience. Fourth, be the architect of your own fate. Although there are many times in life when we can't control circumstances, there are very few times when we can't control how we react to them. The late Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Charles Krauthammer provides an inspiring example of this. Krauthammer became a quadriplegic in medical school following a freak diving accident. Rather than wallow in self-pity, Krauthammer resolved to finish his medical studies from his hospital bed. He did, and without missing a single semester. Fifth, 
Take an honest inventory of your life. Make a real effort to discover how you have contributed to your own misery. In other words, how many of your life's speed bumps have you created? This will help you see that the ability to change your life lies as much within you as in external circumstances. You can then avoid those behaviors that expose you to failure or difficulty. Focus on your power, not your helplessness. And the greatest power anyone has is the capacity to change. You can certainly experience happy moments without resilience, but to lead a happy life, it's essential. I'm Dr. Stephen Marmer, psychiatrist, UCLA Medical School for Prager University. In Plymouth, Massachusetts, in the autumn of 1621, 53 men, women, and children celebrated their first harvest in the New World. The great Indian chief, Massasoit, brought 90 of his men to the three-day party. From all reports, a good time was had by all. How did this event, which happened almost 400 years ago, become a part of the American story and our oldest national tradition? Credit goes to many people, but two stand out. One you know and one you should know, Abraham Lincoln and Sarah Josepha Hale. More on both in a moment. As a religious people, Americans have always had a keen sense they have been blessed by providence. The Pilgrims certainly felt this, and so did subsequent generations, including George Washington. Washington was the first president to declare a national day of public thanksgiving and praise. But it wasn't until the Civil War that the idea of a national day of thanksgiving fully took hold. In the autumn of 1863, at the height of the Civil War, when Americans were bitterly divided, Abraham Lincoln nevertheless called for a day of national thanksgiving. Lincoln began his proclamation this way. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. This was an extraordinary way to characterize 1863, the bloodiest year of the war. But even in the midst of a civil war of unequaled severity and magnitude, Lincoln continued, the nation had much to be thankful for and much to look forward to. The day was coming when America would again be united and experience, as Lincoln put it, a large increase of freedom. It was a profoundly hopeful message, reminding Americans of their nation's capacity for renewal. Lincoln's decision to call for a national thanksgiving came at the urging of a far-sighted and persistent magazine editor who believed such a celebration would have a deep moral influence on the American character. Her name was Sarah Josepha Hale. More than any single person, she is the reason we celebrate Thanksgiving today. By the 1840s, many states had established an annual day of Thanksgiving, but the date varied widely from state to state. Hale saw the value of a day in which the entire nation celebrated as one. For two decades, she conducted a campaign to consolidate public support for her idea. As the influential editor of one of the most popular periodicals of the 19th century, year after year she wrote columns making the case for the holiday. She published fiction and poems with a Thanksgiving Day theme, and she offered her readers recipes for traditional Thanksgiving dishes, such as roast turkey and pumpkin pie. And by the way, she also wrote the nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Presidents Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, and Franklin Pierce, to whom she had written letters, showed little interest in her cause, but Lincoln saw its potential. His proclamation was the first in what became an unbroken string of annual Thanksgiving proclamations by every subsequent president. Congress finally sealed the deal in 1941, when President Franklin Roosevelt signed legislation making Thanksgiving an official national holiday. Lincoln and Hale believed the act of expressing gratitude had tremendous healing power. In his Thanksgiving proclamation, Lincoln spoke not as commander-in-chief of the Union forces, but as president of the entire nation, North and South. He made no reference to rebels or enemies. Rather, the president spoke of the whole American people. 
It's a message that resonates today when Americans, even within families, are divided over issues of politics and culture. Thanksgiving, our nation's oldest tradition, brings us together just as it brought the pilgrims and Indians together in 1621. Lincoln said it best when he called on every American to celebrate Thanksgiving with one heart and one voice. Thanksgiving gives us a moment to focus on the blessings of being Americans, on the prosperity, security, and freedom we enjoy. If Lincoln could focus on these blessings in the middle of the Civil War, we should certainly be able to do so today. Here's a suggestion. At this year's Thanksgiving table, ask everyone to spend a minute to say what they are grateful for. I suspect you'll find your guests will have a long and eloquent list, and if they don't, you can help them out. Suggest they start with family, friends, and living in the freest country in the world. After all, if we don't give thanks, what's the point of Thanksgiving? I'm Melanie Kirkpatrick, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and author of Thanksgiving, The Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience for Prager University. As an historian, I'm often asked if I could stop one event in modern history from happening, what would it be? My answer is World War I. If there had been no World War I, there would have been no Russian Revolution, no World War II, no Holocaust, no Cold War. And that doesn't even consider the millions who died in the war itself. Following the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, Europe experienced an unprecedented period of economic growth. Brought about by the Industrial Revolution, this new prosperity spawned rapid developments in science, medicine, art, and political philosophy. The future of civilization never looked brighter. And then suddenly, it all went up in flames. The fuse was lit in June 1914 in a street in Sarajevo, Bosnia. It was there that Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. It should have been no more than a sad footnote in history. Instead, it changed history. Austria-Hungary, seeking to avenge the Archduke's murder, declared war on Serbia. But before taking this drastic step, it asked for and received a blessing from its powerful ally, Germany. Serbia, knowing that it had no chance against Austria-Hungary, called on its ally, Russia, to defend it. Russia agreed. To strengthen its hand, Russia solicited French support should war break out. France, ever suspicious of German intentions, assented. Germany then made a preemptive move to take France out of the war. The German command, having long planned this war, invaded France through neutral Belgium. This prompted Britain to join France against Germany. Suddenly, the entire continent was engulfed in war. The key player was Germany. Their strategy was to punch through Belgium and France and capture Paris before the French had time to react. This was the so-called Schlieffen Plan, named after the German general who conceived it. With France conquered, they would turn their attention to Russia. That Germany thought it would actually work comes down to one man, Germany's leader, Kaiser Wilhelm II. The Emperor of Germany from 1888 until his forced abdication in 1918, Wilhelm was a profoundly unpleasant, unstable and vicious personality. By 1914, he believed that Germany should not only dominate Europe, but the entire world. Had the Schlieffen Plan worked, Germany most certainly would have, but it didn't work. The British and the French put up stiff resistance in the West. Russia did the same in the East. The losses incurred by all sides were immediate and appalling. The widespread use, for the first time, of barbed wire, machine guns, tanks, and worst of all, poison gas, turns the fields of France and the steppes of Russia into vast cemeteries. By 1917, the war was at a stalemate. Who knows how long it would have stayed that way if the United States had not been drawn in. Ironically, President Woodrow Wilson had been elected largely because he promised to keep America out of Europe's war. 
His attitude changed when Germany attacked American merchant ships in the Atlantic. The final straw was the infamous Zimmermann telegram, in which Germany promised to give Mexico, in exchange for its military support, much of the American Southwest, including Texas. The infusion of American manpower and weaponry allowed the Allies to take the initiative. The war finally ended in November of 1918. 16 million people, soldiers and civilians, were dead. 3 million Russians, 2.5 million Germans, 1.7 million French, 1 million British, and 117,000 Americans. Russia was now in the hands of Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks. France and Britain were physically and morally shattered. Germany, forced into a humiliating surrender treaty at Versailles, would soon be further decimated by runaway inflation that destroyed what was left of its economy. Meanwhile, the United States retreated into isolationism. It was a pause, not a peace. The stage was being set for a new and very much worse disaster, a Second World War, one that would lead to three times the deaths of the first one. It would be instigated by a madman who fought for the Kaiser and shared the same dream of world domination. Had it not been for World War I, we would never have heard of him. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. It's been 50 years since Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death on a motel balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. And over the decades, he has become one of the most revered figures in American history. There is an impressive memorial to him in Washington, D.C., and a museum celebrating his life in Atlanta, Georgia. Countless schools and boulevards have been named after him, and a national holiday is dedicated to his memory. How is it, then, that so much of his legacy, what he hoped to pass on to the future, has been lost. King wanted equality under the law and said famously that people ought to judge one another based on character, not skin color. But he also believed that blacks had an important role to play in their own advancement. The black civil rights battles in America are now over and King's side won. The best indication of that may be that King has had no real successor. If black Americans were still faced with legitimate threats to civil rights, such as legal discrimination or voter disenfranchisement, it's likely that leaders of King's caliber would have emerged to carry on the fight. Instead, what we have today are pretenders who have turned the civil rights movement into an industry, if not a racket. And what have these racketeers accomplished? A lot for themselves and very little for their constituents. Racial gaps in income, education, and home ownership were narrowing in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. But after King was replaced as the spokesman for black America by the likes of Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and others, these gaps began to widen in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. This suggests that the racial disparities that continue today aren't driven by whatever racism that still exists, despite all the claims to the contrary from progressives and their allies in the media. It also suggests that black culture, attitudes toward marriage, education, work, and the rule of law plays a much larger role than the left wants to acknowledge. More marches won't address fatherless homes. More sit-ins won't lower black crime rates or narrow the school achievement gap. Electing more black politicians and appointing more black government officials can't compensate for these cultural deficiencies either. Black mayors, congressmen, senators, police chiefs, and school superintendents have become commonplace since the 1970s. Even the election of a black president twice, failed to close the racial divide in many key measures. Black-white differences in poverty, home ownership, and incomes all grew wider under President Obama. Discussion of antisocial behavior in poor black communities, let alone the possibility that it plays a significant role in racial inequality, has become another casualty of the post-60s era. King and other black leaders at the time spoke openly about the need for more responsible behavior. After remarking on the disproportionately high inner-city crime rates, King told a black congregation in St. Louis that we've got to do something about our moral standards. We know that there are many things wrong in the white world, he said, but there are many things wrong in the black world, too. We can't keep on blaming the white man. 
there are things we must do for ourselves. The pretenders to King's legacy mostly ignore this advice, preferring instead to keep the onus on whites, where King tried to instill the importance of personal responsibility and self-determination, his counterparts today spend more time making excuses for counterproductive behavior and dismissing any criticism of it as racist. Activists who long ago abandoned King's colorblind standard, which was the basis for the landmark civil rights laws enacted in the 1960s, tell young black Americans today that they are victims first and foremost. White society is against you, they say even if you have no clear examples of discrimination to point to. They are told that fire hoses and poll taxes have been replaced by unconscious racism, white privilege, and microaggressions. A generation of blacks who have more opportunity than any previous generation are being taught that America offers them little more than bigoted teachers, biased employers, and trigger-happy cops. It's not only a lie, but as King understood, it's also self-destructive. Black activists and white progressives stress racism because it serves their own interest, not because it actually improves the station of blacks. But this neglect of the role that blacks must themselves play in writing their own lives can only make matters worse. A half century after King's death, plenty of people are paying him lip service. Far too few are following his example. I'm Jason Riley of the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. He's a millionaire. Even today, that phrase has a magical ring to it. And what image do you see? Probably a guy in a $1,000 suit pulling up in his luxury car to his 10-bedroom mansion. He doesn't have a care in the world. Why should he? He's got all the money in the world. Who knows how he got it? Maybe his parents left it to him, or he got lucky in the stock market, or acquired it in some dishonest way. What does it matter? It's out of your reach, right? I don't blame you if you think this way. I thought that way once myself. It's how Hollywood and the popular media like to portray the wealthy, the 1%. But it couldn't be further from the truth. How can I say that? Because my research team and I surveyed and interviewed over 10,000 millionaires. We learned a lot about them. What we found out surprised me and I suspect will surprise you too. But before I explode some millionaire myths, let me first define what I mean by a millionaire. It means someone who has $1 million in net assets. That is, the total of their assets, bank accounts, and investments, minus debts, totals $1 million or more. According to a recent report, there are almost 11 million millionaires in the United States today, more than ever. But here's the kicker. That same report shows the number of people living paycheck to paycheck is on the rise. With one in three unable to cover a $2,000 emergency with cash. The key difference between the so-called haves and have-nots? Well, that's what really blew us away. But before I give you the answer, I need to deal with some myths about the millionaires we talked to. Myth number one, wealthy people inherited all their money. The truth is, 79% of millionaires receive zero inheritance. That's right, zip from mom and dad. They earned it all on their own. Myth number two, wealthy people are lucky. This is the one that I believed for a long time. But in reality, 76% of millionaires say that nothing extraordinary happened to enhance their wealth. No lottery wins, no stock market killing. Discipline and hard work were the key factors. As for luck, the luckiest thing in most of their lives was being born in or becoming a citizen of the United States. Myth number three, wealthy people have prestigious private school educations. Wrong again. 62% of millionaires went to public state schools. You don't have to go to an Ivy League school to do well. Myth number four, wealthy people have high paying jobs. Not true at all. One third of millionaires never had a six-figure household income in a single working year. Really, I'm not making it up. So what makes these millionaires so extraordinary? You ready for the shocking answer? Here it is. Nothing. Nothing at all. Remember, I said that there was one key thing that separated the haves from the have-nots. 
It's the attitude millionaires have toward money. They have learned to control it and not let it control them. So if you want to achieve financial security, you need to change your mindset. The sooner, the better. You have to start with the belief that it's possible for you to become a millionaire. I can give you 10,000 examples of people like you who have done it. Next, you have to take responsibility for where you are financially right now. And wherever you are and however you got there, you've got to own it. My friend Dave Ramsey says, if you're the problem, it also means you're the solution. And that's actually good news. It means your financial destiny is in your own hands. Once you've accepted where you are, you have to create a plan and set goals. You need to pay off debt and build up savings methodically. 92% of millionaires set long-term goals for their money. There are no shortcuts. Reaching millionaire status won't just happen accidentally. It takes what I call intense intentionality and, of course, hard work. But I believe just about anyone who's willing to work hard and be disciplined about spending and saving can become a millionaire in America today. If you had talked to all the ordinary Americans like I have who have made it, you'd believe it too. The opportunity is there. Take it. This is America, where there's always room for one more millionaire. I'm Chris Hogan, author of Everyday Millionaires for Prager University. I am the proud son of immigrants from Bangladesh. I was raised in New York City, which has benefited enormously from the energy and ambition of the millions of people born abroad who've chosen to make it their home. But I also believe that America's immigration system needs to work for America. And right now, that is simply not the case. We need a new immigration system. So what should it be? We're often presented with two stark choices, severe restrictions or open borders. I think there's a better way. But before I offer a solution, let's look at the usual suspects. The case for open borders is, on the surface, pretty attractive. Tens of millions of people around the world would be grateful to come to America for the chance to live in peace and earn a decent living. The vast majority of them mean us no harm. Why not give them a chance to share in the blessings of liberty? The simple answer is that our country is more than just a marketplace. We're a democracy based on a social contract. Americans pay taxes so that, among other things, the poorest, most unlucky among us can still lead decent and dignified lives. If you can't work, you might be eligible for unemployment benefits or disability. If you do work, but your paycheck doesn't go far enough for you to afford medical care or food for your kids, we have a safety net designed to help you stay afloat. Liberals and conservatives disagree on how extensive this safety net ought to be, but they all agree it needs to be there. The question is, how far are we willing to stretch it? A century ago, immigrants who found they couldn't make it in America had little choice but to go back home. That is no longer the case. These days, immigrants who can't earn enough to support their families have access to many government benefits. That doesn't make them bad people. In an age of offshoring and automation, wages for menial jobs don't go very far. If we only admitted a modest number of low-skill immigrants, say as political refugees, we could easily handle it. But over the past 40 years, we have allowed millions of low-skill immigrants into the country, both legally and illegally. While highly educated immigrants pay far more in taxes than they consume in benefits, the opposite is true of immigrants with less than a high school diploma. Immigrant engineers working for Google, Amazon, and Apple do just fine without government help. The immigrant janitors and busboys who serve them struggle to afford housing and to give their kids a decent start in life. Without government aid, many would go hungry. If we were to open our borders, the number of low-skilled immigrants would skyrocket, and so too would the cost of meeting their needs. Ironically, this would only exacerbate the wealth disparity that so animates the open borders crowd. Maybe the rich could wall themselves off in gated communities. But the growing ranks of the poor and even the middle class would have to deal with ever more strained social services. That could provoke resentment strong enough to set off real class warfare. 
If open borders are a bad idea, so too is severely restricting immigration. For one, immigration has always been part of the American story, and it continues to be an essential source of talent, from Silicon Valley to medicine to pro sports. Why shut ourselves off from the dynamism and energy that immigrants can bring? Thankfully, there is a way to fix this problem. We can modernize the system to give priority to those who have strong skills and job offers. People, in other words, who will pay more in taxes than they need in benefits. Today, we admit about two-thirds of immigrants on the basis of family ties and only 15% on the basis of skills. We need a course correction. We should limit family immigration to immediate family members, such as spouses and minor children, while greatly expanding the number of skills-based visas. A skills-based point system would be a huge boon for people around the world looking to live the American dream. It would give them a predictable, step-by-step -step guide for how to better their chances at a green card. Just as importantly, by prioritizing immigrants with strong skills, we'd make the safety net much easier to sustain for those with low skills whom we'd still admit, albeit at a more modest level. Let's announce to the world that if you're ambitious, if you have skills we prize, the golden door is open. If you can support yourself and your family and add to our economy, we want you. If we aspire to an immigration system that works, this is the most realistic and idealistic choice. I'm Raihan Salam, Executive Editor of National Review for Prager University. It's hard to imagine there would have been a United States of America without George Washington. He was there at the birth of the nation. He successfully guided it through war and nurtured it in peace. How did he do it? Not by being a great general, a potent political theorist, or even a clever politician. He was none of those things. And yet he was admired by generals, political theorists, and politicians. Why? Because he was a man great men trusted. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, and so many others looked up to him. Literally. He was one of the tallest men of his era at six feet three. Add courage, integrity, and wisdom, and you have a truly impressive figure. Let's start with his courage. That was never in doubt. If anything, he had too much of it. Bold to the point of rashness as a young man, he fought for the British against the French over control of the Ohio Valley, then the westernmost point of the American wilderness. Throughout that conflict, known as the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, Washington was always in the thick of the action. His aides often struggled to keep him from surging too far ahead of his own troops. In one battle, his coat was pierced four times by musket fire. Horses were shot out from under him. Amazingly, some would say miraculously, he was never wounded, not so much as a flesh wound. By the time the revolution broke out in April of 1775, Washington was firmly committed to the cause of American independence. He arrived in Philadelphia in May of that year to offer his services to the Continental Congress. He was quickly made commander of the new rebel army. There was only one problem. There was no army to speak of. There was just a ragtag collection of state militias. How was Washington going to defeat the greatest military force in the world with that? It was a problem the general struggled with for eight and a half years. That he managed to hold the army together, organize it into a disciplined fighting force, and guide it to victory was testament to his fortitude, his patience, and his personal bravery. Of his integrity, one need only look at what he did when the war ended, exactly what he had promised to do when the war began. He resigned his military command and went home to Mount Vernon. By stepping down, Washington raised himself up as the embodiment of Republican heroism. It is said that King George III asked the London-based American painter, Benjamin West, what Washington was likely to do when peace came. West replied that Washington would probably return to his farm. The king was astounded. If he does that, his majesty declared, he will be the greatest man in the world. 
This story may be apocryphal, but the Newburgh Rebellion and how Washington handled it is not. With experience had come wisdom. As the revolution wound down, a group of officers refused to give up their arms until they were paid. If they didn't get their money, which Congress didn't have, they would take control of the government. It was not an idle threat, no less a figure that Alexander Hamilton was in a panic. Washington, no great orator, sought to defuse their anger. They had risked everything to create a Republican society, he told the officers. To abandon the cause now, when true victory was so close, would mean all their sacrifices would have been in vain. However convincing the speech may have been, it was a simple gesture that carried the day. He concluded his remarks by reading to them a letter sent to him from a member of Congress. Suddenly he stopped. From his pocket he pulled a pair of spectacles. None of the officers had ever seen him wear them. Putting the glasses on, Washington said, Gentlemen, you must pardon me. I have grown gray in the service of my country and now find myself going blind. He finished reading the letter and left the hall without another word. The gesture, sincerely offered with just the right touch of stagecraft, pierced the hearts of his men. Many were moved to tears. They immediately passed a resolution declaring their loyalty to civilian government. George Washington had saved the revolution once again. It wouldn't be the last time. During the writing of the Constitution and during his eight years as president, Washington was repeatedly called upon to hold the fractious young nation together. He never failed to do so. We commonly refer to George Washington now as the father of our country. It's hard to imagine any nation ever had a better one. I'm John Roadhamel, author of George Washington, The Wonder of the Age, for Prager University. Capitalism versus Socialism. We can sum up each economic system in one line. Capitalism is based on human greed. Socialism is based on human need, right? No, wrong, so wrong, it's exactly backwards. And I'll prove it to you. Been on Amazon lately? Each of the thousands of products Amazon offers represents the work of people who believe they have something you want or need. If they're right, they prosper. If they're wrong, they don't. That's how the free market works. It encourages people to improve their lives by satisfying the needs of others. No one starts a business making a thing or providing a service for themselves. They start a business to make things or provide services for others. Now, I speak from personal experience. When I was the CEO of the company that owns Carl's Jr. and Hardy's restaurant chains, we spent millions of dollars every year trying to determine what customers wanted. If our customers didn't like something, we changed it, and fast. Because if we didn't, our competitors would, pun intended, eat us for lunch. The consumer, that's you, has the ultimate power. In effect, you vote with every dollar you spend. In a socialist economy, the government has the ultimate power. It decides what you get from a limited supply it decides should exist. Instead of millions of people making millions of decisions about what they want, a few people, government elites, decide what people should have and how much they should pay for it. Not surprisingly, they always get it wrong. Have you ever noticed that late-stage socialist failures always run out of essential items like toilet paper? Of course, this isn't a problem for those who have the right connections with the right people. Those chosen few get whatever they want. But everyone else is out of luck. Venezuela, once the richest country in South America, is the most recent example of socialism driving a prosperous country into an economic ditch. Now, maybe you think it's an unfair example. I I'm not sure why, but okay. We'll ignore the fact that leftist activists celebrated it as a great socialist success right up until it wasn't. But what about Western European countries? Don't they have socialist economies? People seem pretty happy there. Why can't we have what they have? Free health care, free college, stronger unions. Good question, and the answer may surprise you. There are no socialist countries in Western Europe. Most are just as capitalist as the United States. 
The only difference, and it's a big one, is that they offer more government benefits than the U.S. does. We can argue about the cost of these benefits and the point at which they reduce individual initiative, thus doing more harm than good. Scandinavians have been debating those questions for years. But only a free market capitalist economy can produce the wealth necessary to sustain all of the supposedly free stuff Europeans enjoy. To get the free stuff, after all, you have to create enough wealth to generate enough tax revenue to pay for everything the government gives away. Without capitalism, you're Venezuela. In a 2015 speech at Harvard, Denmark's prime minister took great pains to make this point. I know that some people in the U.S. associate the Nordic model with socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. So when you point to Denmark as a paragon of socialism, you're really singing the praises of capitalism. The more capitalism, the less socialism you need. Look at America since 2017. A policy of lower taxes and less government regulation, that's more capitalism, has led to a robust economic expansion, something thought impossible just a few years earlier. Unemployment, notably among minority groups typically most at risk for poverty, is at a generational low. Economic expansion gets people off welfare and into work. That's less socialism. None of this requires a degree in economics. Common sense is all you need. That's why it's so frustrating to see young people praising socialism and criticizing capitalism. It's bad enough that they're working against their own interests. Better job prospects, better wages, personal freedom. But they're also working against the interests of the less fortunate. Capitalism leads to economic democracy. Socialism leads to the economic dictatorship of the elite. Always and everywhere. So beware what you ask for. You just might get it. I'm Andy Puzder, the author of The Capitalist Comeback for Prager University. The most famous fire in American history happened in Chicago on October 8, 1871. But it's not the fire that is so remarkable. It's what happened afterwards. To understand why, we first need to know something about the city's history. In 1840, Chicago was a small town of 4,500 souls. It ranked 92nd in population in the United States, yet only three decades later, by 1870, just a year before the Great Fire, Chicago was closing in on a population of 300,000, making it the fifth biggest city in America and the fastest growing city in the world. What led to all this rapid growth? In three words, location, location, location. Chicago was near the center of the country and near where the waterways and railways met, city historian Tim Samuelson notes. It was a perfect place for anything and anyone to get anywhere. Timing had a lot to do with it, too. America was moving from a rural to an industrial power. Chicago was right in the middle of the action. Ironically, its rapid growth was almost its undoing. Chicago had to build and build quickly, and so they built it out of wood, explains Sarah Marcus of the Chicago History Museum. It was quick, it was easy, and it was cheap. And as it turned out, very flammable. By most accounts, the fire started on the city's west side, near the DeCoven Street barn of Patrick and Catherine O'Leary. No one is sure of the cause, but it could have been anything, from vandals to a drunken neighbor to that clumsy cow of urban legend. Within minutes, the blaze roared out of control, tearing through Chicago's business district. The fire was so hot, it created its own tornado of flame. By 3.30 a.m., all hope of saving large parts of the city was gone. Nearly 30 hours later, the fire finally died. The reason? There was nothing left to burn. The losses were staggering. The fire claimed nearly 300 lives, destroyed over 17,000 buildings, covering almost 3.5 square miles, and caused damage of over $200 million, about $3.8 billion today. Roughly a third of the city lay in ruins, and one out of every three people living in Chicago, nearly 100,000 residents, became homeless overnight. All the law offices were destroyed, all the major hotels were destroyed, all the major department stores were destroyed, and all the major banks were destroyed. 
Chicago weather historian Tom Skilling notes, in those days, there were no national or state agencies to help. Chicago was on its own. What was to be done? To most of Chicago citizens, the answer was obvious. Rebuild. Make the city better than ever. Yes, there were many victims of the fire, but there was no sense of victimhood. Even before the bricks stopped smoking, the people of Chicago went to work. First, the damage had to be assessed. The death and destruction were obvious, but there were some major pluses as well. The stockyards and meatpacking plants had been spared. Two-thirds of the grain elevators survived. And most importantly, the railway and rail stock escaped major damage. This was critical because it would allow shipments of building materials and private relief aid to come pouring in from across the country and around the world. The banking community quickly rallied. Within 48 hours, 12 of the 29 banks that had burned to the ground were operating in makeshift facilities. Merchants, large and small, immediately set up temporary shops. Local financier Henry Greenbaum sent letters to investment bankers all over the globe. This wasn't the time to give up on the city. It was the time, he told them, to buy in. Many agreed. Among them were creative young architects attracted to the nearly blank slate the city presented to them. They would raise a new city from a new product, steel. Their work praised and copied all over the world came to be known as the Chicago School. By 1890, only 20 years after the fire, Chicago's population passed the one million mark, becoming the second biggest city in America. The population had more than tripled since the Windy City's darkest night. Why is this all important to know? Because the government didn't rebuild Chicago. Chicago rebuilt Chicago, and with astonishing speed and energy. A can-do spirit, devotion to community, and free market capitalism made it happen. It's impossible to look at this achievement without admiration and more than a bit of nostalgia. Could we summon that same spirit today? Yes, we can. But only if we proudly retell stories like this one that remind us the greatness of America is not a product of government, but a product of self-government, empowered citizens pursuing their own best interests. I'm Lee Habib, host of Our American Stories for Prager University. Western civilization. It's been around for a while, but suddenly everybody is talking about it. Some are anxious to save it. Others are happy to see it go. But what exactly is Western civilization? Is it the great cathedrals of Europe or the Nazi concentration camps? Is it the freedoms secured in the U.S. Constitution or chattel slavery? Life-saving medicines or poison gas? The left likes to focus on the bad, genocide, slavery, environmental destruction. But those have been present in every civilization from time immemorial. The positives are unique to the West. Religious tolerance, abolition of slavery, Universal human rights, the development of the scientific method, these are accomplishments of a scope and scale that only the West can claim. These aren't the only achievements that make the West special and uniquely successful. As Western thought evolved, it secured the rights of women and minorities, lifted billions of people out of poverty, and invented most of the modern world. Progress hasn't been a straight line, of course, but the arc of history is clear. The obvious proof is that the world is overwhelmingly Western. And, with few exceptions, those parts of the world that aren't, aspire to be. Why? Why has Western civilization been so successful? There are many reasons, but the best place to start is with the teachings and philosophies that emerged from two ancient cities, Jerusalem and Athens. Jerusalem represents religious revelation as manifested in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the beliefs that a good God created an ordered universe and that this God demands moral behavior from his paramount creation, man. The other city, Athens, represents reason and logic as expressed by the great Greek thinkers, Plato and Aristotle and many others. These two ways of thinking, revelation and reason, live in constant tension. Judeo-Christian religion posits that there are certain fundamental truths handed down to us by a transcendent being. We didn't invent these truths, we received them from God. The rules he lays down for us are vital for building a functioning, moral civilization and for leading a happy life. Greek thinking posits that we only know truth by what we observe, 
test, and measure. It is not faith, but fact, that drives our understanding and exploration of the universe. Western civilization, and only Western civilization, has found a way to balance both religious belief and human reason. Here's how the balance works. The Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that God created an ordered universe and that we have an obligation to try to make the world better. This offers us purpose and suggests that history moves forward. Most pagan religions taught the opposite, that the universe is illogical and random and that history is cyclical. History just endlessly repeats itself, in which case, why bother to innovate or create anything new? Second, Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that every human is created in the image of God, that is, each individual's life is infinitely valuable. This seems self-evident to us now, but only because we have lived with this belief for so long. The far more natural belief is that the strong should subjugate the weak, which is precisely what people did in nearly every society in all of history. Only by recognizing the divine in others did we ever move beyond this amoral thinking toward the concern for human rights, democracy, and free enterprise that characterized the West. But Judeo-Christian religion alone didn't build our modern civilization. We also required Greek reason to teach us objective observation that man has the capacity to search beyond revelation for answers. Greek reason brought us the notion of the natural law, the idea that we could discover the natural purpose, the telos, of everything in creation by looking to its character. Human beings were created with the unique capacity to reason. Therefore, our telos was to reason. By investing reason with so much power, Greek thought became integral to the Western mission. Nowhere is this more perfectly expressed than in the American Revolution, in which the founding fathers took the best of the European Enlightenment with its roots in Greek thought and the best of Judeo-Christian practice with its roots in the Bible and melded them into a whole new political philosophy. Without Judeo-Christian values, we fall into scientific materialism, the belief that physical matter is the only reality, and therefore also fall into nihilism, the belief that life has no meaning, that we are merely stellar dust in a cold universe. Without Greek reason, we fall into fanaticism, the belief that fundamentalist adherence to unprovable principles represents the only path toward meaning. The Soviet Union, Communist China, and other socialist tyrannies rejected faith and murdered 100 million people in the 20th century. Much of the modern Muslim world has embraced faith, but rejected reason. It's noteworthy that when the Muslim world did embrace Greek reason from the 8th to the 14th centuries, it was a leading center for scientific advancement. So again, we need both Jerusalem and Athens, revelation and reason. And yet many want to reject both. These people call themselves progressives. Ironically, they want to take us backwards to a time when man was governed neither by reason nor faith, but by feeling, and therefore back to a time of moral chaos and disorder of feeling over fact. It would be a fatal mistake to follow the progressives. Stick with Athens and Jerusalem. I'm Ben Shapiro, editor of The Daily Wire and author of The Right Side of History for Prager University. One of the criticisms many people make against the Bible is that it depicts God in male terms. The most obvious example is God is referred to as he. Why did the Bible do this? Well, here's the answer. Because the Bible is preoccupied with making a kinder, less violent, more just world. If you share these goals, and I suspect you do, then you'll have to agree the Bible made the right decision. Before I explain, however, I need to add an obvious caveat. The God of the Bible is neither male nor female. God transcends gender. What I'm talking about here is why God is depicted in male terms in the Bible. Gender-wise, the Bible had three choices, masculine, he, feminine, she, or neuter, it. We can readily rule out neuter. For one thing, neuter nouns don't exist in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, which, after all, first introduced this God to us. For another, the biblical God is a personal God to whom we can and must relate, and we cannot relate to, let alone obey or love, an it. Aside from the language issue, the Bible depicts God in masculine terms because, one, the Hebrew Bible's primary concern is making a good world, two, a good world can only be achieved by making good people, and three, the people who commit nearly all the world's violence are males. Therefore, 
It is in both men's and women's interests to depict God in the masculine. Here's why. Without a father or some other male rule giver, young men are likely to do great harm. If there is no male authority figure to give a growing boy rules, it is very difficult for him to control his wilder impulses. As President Barack Obama told an audience in 2008, children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Commenting on that speech, Dr. Alvin Poussant, a psychiatrist with Harvard Medical School, confirmed these statistics. The absence of fathers corresponds with a host of social ills, including dropping out of school and serving time in jail. In other words, if one's primary goal is a good world, specifically a world with far less murder, child abuse, theft, and rape, a God depicted in masculine terms, a father in heaven, not a goddess, a mother in heaven, must be the source of moral commands such as do not murder and do not steal. If the father figure slash rule giver that boys need is not on earth, a morally authoritative masculine God can serve as an effective substitute. Any discomfort you might feel with the masculine depiction of God is not comparable to the pain we will all feel if boys are not civilized into good men. To transform a wild boy into a good man, a male role model is as necessary as a male rule giver. So when the Bible depicts God as merciful, compassionate, and caring for the poor and the widow, it is not so much interested in describing God as in providing a model for humans, especially males, to emulate. If God were depicted as female, young men would deem traits such as compassion, mercy, and care for the downtrodden as feminine and would not identify with them. But if God, their Father in heaven, who was strong, on occasion even a warrior, cares for the poor, and loves justice, mercy, and kindness, then these traits are also masculine and to be emulated. The argument that girls equally need female role models to avoid violence is objectively not true because the problem of mayhem and violence is overwhelmingly a male one. Of course, girls need female role models, but not to avoid violence. And, like boys, girls are more likely to obey a male authority figure. A report released by the Minnesota Psychological Association concluded, in a study of female inmates, more than half came from a father absent home. It is therefore ironic that some women are attempting to render the God of Western religious morality less masculine because if their goal is achieved, it is women who will suffer most from lawless males. We have too many absent fathers on earth to begin to even entertain the thought of having no father in heaven. I'm Dennis Prager. When I was the Prime Minister of Canada, I was often asked this question, why do you support Israel? My response in effect was always the same, why wouldn't I support Israel? Why wouldn't I support a fellow democratic nation where open elections, free speech, and religious tolerance are the everyday norm? Why wouldn't I support a country with a vibrant free press and an independent judiciary? Why wouldn't I support a valuable trading partner and a wellspring of amazing technological innovation? Why wouldn't I support our most critical ally in the Middle East and in the international struggle against terrorism? In a rational world, in a world where simple common sense prevailed, the question, why do you support Israel, would be like asking, why do you support Australia or Canada? But we don't live in that rational, common sense world. So the case for Israel has to be made over and over. I, for one, am happy to make it. Let me start with this. Every military action Israel has ever taken has been to protect itself. Israel is not an aggressor state. It's a defensive state. This has been true from its founding to this day. As a fledgling nation in 1948, Israel was immediately attacked by its Arab neighbors. Their goal was not to contain the tiny new country. It was to annihilate it. 
No nation came to Israel's aid. Not the United States, not my country, Canada, not the United Kingdom, no one. They all thought Israel would lose, but it didn't lose, it won. In 1967, Israel's neighbors again sought to utterly destroy the Jewish state, a nation that had then existed for two decades. Again, Israel prevailed, and it survived another all-out attack in 1973. Those are the big wars, but I'm not sure there's been a single day in Israel's entire history when some act of terror has not been waged against it, inside or outside its borders. There have been two bloody waves of terror, so-called intifadas, in the late 1980s and the early 2000s, when Israelis were blown up on buses, at pizza parlors, and celebrating weddings. There have been incursions from terror groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon. There have been thousands of rocket attacks from Hamas in the Gaza Strip, even after Israel completely withdrew from that territory in 2005. In between the wars, in between the terror, Israel has sought peace with its neighbors, and it has achieved peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. For others, however, every Israeli gesture for peace is met with incitement and violence. I recount this history for one reason. Any nation that has endured what Israel has endured could easily have become a police state. But through it all, Israel has never abandoned its commitment to the rule of law, to democracy, to tolerance. One-fifth of its citizens are Muslim. They enjoy the same rights as Jewish citizens. They occupy key positions in the nation's courts, press, and government. And they have their own parties representing them in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. To say that Muslims in Israel are the freest Muslims in the region is an understatement. How about this as a human rights test? Prisoners in Israel, be they Jewish or Arab, are well-treated, well-fed, and have access to the best possible medical care. Parents and spouses of these prisoners know where they are and that they are safe. Who else in the region but Israel can make that claim? Through all the wars and all the terror, Israel has survived, and especially in the last 20 years, it has thrived. It's known as startup nation, and with good reason. Key components of your cell phone and your laptop were designed in Israel. A drug or a medical device that has saved your life or the life of a loved one may have been developed in Israel. Yet there are leftist politicians, activists, artists, academics, and college students who devote their lives to denouncing Israel, calling for boycotts, demanding it be cut off from academic and professional societies. Do they denounce the Palestinian leadership that hasn't held an election in well over a decade? Do they denounce the leadership of Hamas, who use women and children as human shields to protect their fighters. No, they denounce free, vibrant, democratic, innovative Israel. With all the brutal and violent regimes, not only in the Middle East, but around the world, how is one to explain singling out Israel for condemnation? Sadly, only one explanation fits, anti-Semitism. Do these haters of Israel question the legitimacy of any other democratic nation, of any nation for that matter? Of course, the answer is no. Somehow, they only manage to oppose the Jewish one. The state of Israel has now existed for 70 years. It is one of the freest, most prosperous, most successful nations on earth. Why do I support Israel? Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't anyone? I'm Stephen Harper, 22nd Prime Minister of Canada for Prager University. There are no shortcuts. There are no hacks. If you want to take the easy road, I promise you it's longer and more painful than the hard road. I know. I've lived it. I've ventured down the easy road at times in my life, and it never led to anywhere good. The positive things in my life always came when I faced the biggest challenges. I joined the Navy. I took the hard road in the Navy and made it into the SEAL teams. There, I had the honor of leading men in combat. I learned some lessons along the way, lessons that have been tested on the battlefield and when implemented, lead to success in any arena. One of the best things I've learned is that anyone has what it takes to travel the hard road, to walk the path that leads to success. That includes you. It won't be easy. 
It will demand everything you've got to give, but you can do it. And I want to give you three key principles I've learned that will help you to get it done. Principle number one, discipline equals freedom. That's not a contradiction. It's an equation. Discipline might appear to be the opposite of freedom, but in fact, discipline is the path to freedom. Discipline is the driver of daily execution. Discipline defeats the infinite excuses that hold you back. Some people think motivation is what will compel them to get things done. But motivation is just an emotion, a feeling. And like all feelings, it's fickle. It comes and goes. You can't count on motivation to be there when you need to get through truly challenging times. But you can count on discipline. Discipline is something you dictate. Motivation won't make you exercise every day. Discipline will. Motivation won't stay up late and finish a project for you. Discipline will. Motivation isn't going to get you out of bed in the morning. Discipline will. Make discipline part of your daily life, and your daily life will get better. Principle number two, stay humble. In life, you are going to have to do things that you don't want to do. Maybe things that you don't think you should have to do. Things that offend your precious ego. When I got done with basic SEAL training and reported on board SEAL Team 1, you know what I was assigned to do? I was assigned to clean toilets. That's right, despite having just graduated some of the most difficult military training in the world, despite being assigned to an elite commando unit, my first mission at the actual SEAL Team was to clean toilets. Not exactly a glorious job. But you know what? I did it. I did it to the best of my ability and took pride in doing it well. And that attitude got noticed. If I cared that much about how clean the toilets were, people knew I would do a good job with even more important assignments. After a short period of time, I got those more important assignments. But it was humility that opened the door for me. Now, being humble does not mean you shouldn't be confident. You certainly have to believe that you are a capable person. But don't let confidence turn into arrogance. So keep your ego in check and stay humble. The third and final principle, take ownership of everything. I call this extreme ownership. In the military, the best leaders and the best troops were the ones that took ownership of everything in their world. Not just the things they were responsible for, but for every challenge and obstacle that impacted their mission. When something went wrong, they cast no blame. They made no excuses. They took ownership of the problem and fixed it. You can implement this attitude as well, not only in your job, but in your life. Let other people blame their parents, their boss, or the system. Let weaker people complain that the world isn't fair. You are the leader of your life. Take ownership of everything in it. So, be disciplined in all that you do. Don't subject yourself to the whims of motivation. Stay humble and be willing to do what needs to be done. And take extreme ownership of your life and everything in it. Then, choose the hard path. The path of responsibility, hard work, and sacrifice. The path of discipline, humility, and ownership that ultimately leads to freedom. If you follow these principles, then nothing in the world will stop you. I'm Jocko Willink, host of the Jocko Podcast and author of Extreme Ownership for Prager University. There were 36,525 days in the 20th century. Of these, none was more consequential than June 6, 1944, D-Day, the Allied invasion of Normandy in Nazi-occupied France. It did not end World War II, but without it, the Nazi war machine would not and could not have been defeated. We, of course, know the good guys. America, England and its allies won. But in 1944, there was no certainty of success. In fact, there was just as much doubt 
as confidence. Winston Churchill's senior advisor, Field Marshal Brooke, wrote in his diary, I am very uneasy about the whole operation. It may well be the most ghastly disaster of the whole war. Brooke's fears were entirely reasonable. First, there were tens of thousands of men and millions of tons of material and supplies that had to be moved 100 miles across one of the roughest bodies of water in the world, the English Channel, and it had to be kept secret. If the Germans knew where and when the Allies were landing, they could mass forces against them and turn the beaches of northern France into killing fields. To prevent this, the Allies took every possible precaution. Their air forces destroyed bridges, roads and railways that might be used by the Germans to rush troops to the invasion site. Everyone knew the attack was coming. The key was to keep the Germans guessing. Fake radio chatter was broadcast to suggest the beaches near Calais would be the landing point. Double agents leaked fake details of units forming in southeast England, and movie set designers built phony tanks, planes and ships to support the ruse of an army preparing to cross near Dover for the benefit of German reconnaissance pilots and spies. The Germans swallowed it all. But the Nazis were not the only enemy the Allied forces faced. Mother Nature was just as threatening. The 23,000 paratroopers and glider-borne infantry jumping into Normandy needed moderate winds to be effective. The 12,000 Allied aircraft needed clear skies. The invasion fleet of 6,000 vessels needed calm seas, and there had to be a low tide to expose Nazi obstacles and mines. When high winds and rain began pummeling the Channel, Allied Supreme Commander General Dwight Eisenhower postponed the invasion date of June 5th by 24 hours. That might not sound like a significant delay, but it was. All forces were concentrated and ready to go. All the plans, all the deceptions could be exposed at any moment. Then came a new forecast. The weather appeared to be breaking. There might be a 12-hour window of opportunity. Eisenhower gave the order, we go. Immediately, the greatest invasion fleet ever assembled set sail. On board were over 130,000 young soldiers. Consider for a moment who these soldiers were. The average age of the American GIs was 21. Most had never seen combat or even been 50 miles from their hometown. As they sailed to the French shoreline, Eisenhower wrote a press release in case of catastrophe. D-Day was an all-or-nothing affair. A new invasion strategy would take months, if not years, to devise. The initial battle reports were seriously troubling. At Omaha Beach, overlooked by cliffs honeycombed with trenches, cannon and machine guns, the Americans took heavy losses. I might have killed hundreds that morning, reflected German soldier Heinz Severlo manning one of the bunkers. The rough surf also took its toll. Dr. Hal Baumgarten, with the US Army's 116th Infantry, remembered, some of the fellows were pulled under by their wet combat jackets and heavy equipment. We couldn't help, they just drowned. Further along, army rangers took heavy casualties as they scaled the cliffs under intense gunfire. However, by midday, with US naval support, the Germans, low on supplies and ammunition, began to fold. Nazi reinforcements, including hundreds of tanks, which might have made all the difference, were not ordered to Normandy until the afternoon. Before the Germans could mount an effective counterattack, the Allies had secured all five landing beaches. Churchill had expected 20,000 to be killed on D-Day. Fortunately, heavy though they were, the losses were much lower. Of the 156,000 Allied personnel who hit the beaches that day, 10,000 became casualties. Of these, 5,000 were killed. No one died in vain. Their sacrifice meant an end to Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Another year of bitter fighting lay ahead, but D-Day... June 6, 1944, was a pivotal step on the road to forever removing the Nazi tyranny from Europe and the world. I'm Peter Caddick Adams, author of Sand and Steel, A New History of D-Day, for Prager University. The year is 1984. One company, Microsoft, dominates the computer world. It's their way or the highway. Conform or die. 
This snapshot in time was perfectly captured in one of the most famous commercials in TV history. Set in the gray dystopian future, row after row of men stare blankly at a giant screen from which Big Brother, the all-powerful leader from George Orwell's classic novel 1984, addresses them. Suddenly, riot police burst into the hall, chasing a beautiful blonde woman in a white shirt and red shorts. Before they can grab her, she hurls a sledgehammer into the screen, shattering Big Brother and his grip on the masses. The narrator informs us that Apple's breakthrough product, the Macintosh computer, will be the device that sets us all free. Looking back, Apple largely lived up to its promise. A new wave of companies, each in its own way, followed the example set by Apple's legendary CEO, Steve Jobs. Google gave us instant access to vast amounts of information. Facebook gave us a new way to connect with friends, family, and the world. Twitter brought this world to us in real time. And YouTube allowed anyone with a smartphone to become a virtual broadcast network onto themselves. It was glorious and empowering. But that was yesterday. Today, it's 1984 all over again. Big Brother's back with an important twist. Our former liberators now want to be our masters. Apple, Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, the giants of social media, are demanding conformity to their values. It's their way or the highway. Conform or die. This image is perfectly captured, not by an ad, but by this recent real-life scene. Row after row of men and women stare up at Tim Cook, Apple's CEO, as he makes a presentation, ironically, before a civil rights group. We only have one message for those who seek to push hate, division, and violence. You have no place on our platforms, Cook tells his audience. You have no home here. Hate? Division? According to whom? The answer is obvious. According to Apple, Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, they are becoming the big brother Orwell foresaw. Conform or die. Cook's ideas are exactly the same as his fellow chief executives at Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Disagree with Big Brother on, say, politics or morality, and Big Brother will shut you up by shutting you down. And what is it that Big Brother doesn't like? Well, Tim Cook said it. Anything that doesn't conform to his left-wing worldview. The examples are numerous and growing. Megan Murphy, a Canadian feminist, is permanently banned from Twitter for refusing to refer to the transgendered by their preferred pronoun and for writing, women aren't men. Google, Facebook, and Twitter all at various times refused to carry political ads from Tennessee Republican candidate Marsha Blackburn promoting her conservative views. She's hardly the only one this has happened to. And as many of you know, YouTube continues to restrict over 100 of Prager used videos, finding them inappropriate for children. These include titles like, Why Did America Fight the Korean War? Broad-based studies by the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology and by Northwestern University have confirmed what these examples clearly suggest, bias against conservatives at Google and other big tech sites. And this is the bias we can plainly see, what we don't see, what Big Brother hides from us, what is referred to as shadow banning, may be even more pernicious. If you're on the left, maybe you're okay with this, but if you're not on the left, or even if you are and you revere the First Amendment, you should be concerned, very concerned. We are advancing swiftly toward an Orwellian 1984 world of stifling one way of thinking conformity. This time, it's not a fictional story. It's real. What's the solution? Simply return to the open market of ideas that served big tech so well for so long. Stop the censorship and let people make up their own minds. Otherwise, America and the rest of what has been known as the free world will cease to be free. That's how serious the big tech threat is. I'm Brent Bozell, founder of the Media Research Center for Prager University. 
There's a book you can read to your children that will make your job as a parent a lot easier. This book will teach them lessons in character, how to distinguish right from wrong, about gratitude, respect, and perseverance. And that's in the opening chapters. Parents have been reading this book to their children for a very long time. It's one reason it's a perpetual bestseller. This book, of course, is the Bible. And you don't have to be religious to read it, and your children don't have to be religious to enjoy it and get a whole lot out of it. Decency, kindness, charity, selflessness, and sacrifice, they're all right there. Consider the story of David and Goliath. Nine feet tall, clad in armor, Goliath is the most fearsome warrior of his day. How could he not be? He's nine feet tall, for goodness sake. Who wants to go against a giant like that? No Israelite, that's for sure. Except for one, a skinny shepherd boy named David. This boy has three things going for him. Courage, a slingshot, and faith that God is with him. As he strides out onto the battlefield to face Goliath in single combat, he holds the future of the Israelite nation, not to mention his own life, in his hands. Now, wrapped up in all of this tension and drama are valuable lessons that any child can profit from. David refuses to be intimidated by a bully. He's willing to act, to show resolve, even in the face of his own self-doubt. His actions paint a portrait of true heroism in the face of true danger. Isn't that the kind of strength we want our children to emulate? To be able to defend themselves and later their families and their country. Or how about the story of the brothers, uh, Cain and Abel? Abel, the shepherd, looks at his lot and he's filled with gratitude for his blessings. He offers as a gift to God the very best of his flock. Cain, the farmer, is selfish, unsatisfied with what he has, and he offers only a paltry gift of grain. When God favors Abel's present, Cain allows jealousy to overwhelm him. God speaks to Cain and tells him, I know you're feeling angry, but you can overcome those feelings and master them. Cain doesn't listen, doesn't control his jealousy, and kills Abel. When God asks Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Cain lies and says, I do not know. And then, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, should have been Cain's answer to his own question. We are responsible for ourselves and we have an obligation to others. We all have emotions and passions, but God has given us the tools to master those emotions and master them we must if we are to live a productive and ethical life. Most important of all, life is a gift from God. We have no right to take it away from the innocent. Murder is evil. All these lessons are contained in this one story. The stories of David and Goliath and Cain and Abel are only two examples of the many invaluable lessons the Bible offers to children. Think of a lesson and there's a Bible story to teach it about family dynamics, friendship, forgiveness, leadership, humility, about what is important and what is not. The Bible also teaches children more effectively than any book ever that they are not the center of the universe. They're accountable to their parents and to God. Children who internalize this lesson are much more likely to be kinder and more mindful of how they behave than those who do not. The Bible discourages narcissism. Of course, the Bible is not merely a children's book. It's a library of wisdom for everyone. Here's how Abraham Lincoln, who was not a churchgoer, but who was steeped in the Bible, described it. In regard to this great book, it is the best gift God has given to man, but for it, we could not know right from wrong. And all things most desirable for man's welfare are to be found portrayed in it. As Lincoln suggests, the Bible is the moral foundation on which Western civilization is built and a point of shared reference. Up until the 1960s, you could cite a Bible story and most people knew exactly what you were talking about. Everyone from Shakespeare to Dickens to Franklin Roosevelt made great use of Bible stories to communicate their themes. We're losing that connection. And that is a terrible shame and a profound cultural loss. If you don't have some biblical literacy, you can't fully appreciate the powerful words of Martin Luther King, for example. Only if you know the story of Moses can you fully appreciate King's poetic vision of having seen the promised land. Of the Bible, Yale theologian George Lindbeck famously said, 
There was a time when every educated person, no matter how professedly unbelieving or secular, knew the actual text from Genesis to Revelation. Our goal should be to get back to that kind of biblical literacy. And it starts with our children, your children. Read them a Bible story tonight. Who knows? You might learn a few things too. I'm Johnny Moore for Prager University. I picked a fine time to become an American. It was a gray, overcast morning in Oakland, California. I was one of 1,094 people of every color and creed from 85 nations, beginning with Afghanistan and ending with Yemen. We had gathered, anxiously clutching the requisite documents, outside the rather antique Paramount Cinema. I wasn't the only new citizen of European origin, but we were a distinct minority. Rather to my surprise, the Chinese were the most numerous group, accounting for close to a fifth of the new Americans. How many Americans became Chinese citizens that week? Next were the Mexicans, more than 150 of them, then the Filipinos, closely followed by the Indians. Yet it was the sheer range of countries represented that was most marvellous. The young man to my right, immaculately dressed in white, was from Eritrea. He had studied computer science in Wales and had initially come to California to work for NASA. I approach any encounter with US bureaucracy weighed down by dread. So, I wondered, would this be like the Department of Motor Vehicles famed for its Soviet-style antagonism to the public? Or would it be more like the implacable, pitiless Internal Revenue Service? In fact, the officials of the US Citizenship and Immigration Services could hardly have been more affable. The Master of Ceremonies was a genial, balding, bespectacled chap who won his audience over with a virtuoso display of multilingualism, chatting to us in what sounded like pretty fluent Spanish, Chinese, French, Hindi, and Tagalog. Yet this was very far from a multicultural occasion. Quite the reverse. To get us in the mood for our impending Americanization, a choir sang a patriotic medley, including a rather baroque setting of the preamble to the Constitution, Yankee Doodle, and Woody Guthrie's This Land Is Your Land. Well, that did it. The way that song conjures up vast American landscapes, from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, always gets me by the throat, because, glimpsed in films, such vistas were what first drew me to the United States. Then came the information about our rights and obligations, specifically our right to vote, our option to obtain a passport, and our inextricable link to the social security system. Nothing, rather disappointingly, about the right to bear arms, and not a word about the spiralling federal debt we were all now on the hook for. The ceremony then became more stirring. A Faces of America video had a distinctly martial soundtrack. We raised our right hands to swear the oath of allegiance, absolutely renouncing all allegiance to any foreign prince, potentate, state or sovereignty, and swearing to bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. Then we placed our right hands on our hearts to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the national flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's heady stuff, even in Oakland on a Thursday morning. And then there he was, the President of the United States himself, much larger than life on the big screen. This country is now your country, Donald Trump told us rather sternly. Our history is now your history, and our traditions are now your traditions. And that wasn't all. You now share the obligation to teach our values to others, to help newcomers assimilate to our way of life. Compare and contrast with the Barack Obama version. Together, we are a nation united not by any one culture or ethnicity, or ideology. The grand finale was God Bless the USA, a country music anthem by Lee Greenwood made famous following the 9-11 terror attacks on New York and Washington. 
it too was a call to arms. And I'm proud to be an American, but at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. More than half a century of being British has made it hard for me not to cringe just a little at this kind of thing. But this hokum is now my hokum. And this president is now my president. Until such time as we the people vote in another one. Yes, I picked a fine time to become an American. Because it's always a fine time. I'm Neil Ferguson, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. Was Jesus a socialist? Well, if socialism is nothing more than being kind to other people, then you might think the answer is yes. But you could be kind to other people and be a capitalist. John D. Rockefeller probably gave away more money than anyone in human history, and he was certainly a capitalist. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have given away millions, too. To get an accurate answer to our question, we need to define socialism. Socialism is the concentration of power into the hands of government elites to achieve the following purposes. Central planning of the economy and the radical redistribution of wealth. Jesus never called for any of that. Nowhere in the New Testament does he advocate for the government to punish the rich or even to use tax money to help the poor. Nor does he promote the ideas of state ownership of businesses or central planning of the economy. In Luke 12, Jesus is confronted by a man who wants him to redistribute wealth. Master, the man says to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replies, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And then he rebukes the man for being envious of his sibling. How about Jesus' parable of the talents? Talents were a form of money in Jesus' day. A man entrusted three of his workers with his wealth. The two who invested the money and made a profit were praised, and the one who buried his share so he wouldn't lose any of it was reprimanded. Sounds a lot more like an endorsement for capitalism than socialism, doesn't it? Yes, Jesus spoke of the difficulty for a rich man to enter heaven, but not because having money is evil. It's not money, rather it is the love of money, the New Testament tells us, that leads to evil. Jesus was warning us not to put acquisition of money and material possessions above our spiritual and moral lives. Was Jesus promoting a socialist model when he kicked the money changers out of the temple in Jerusalem? Again, the answer is no. Note the location where the incident occurred. It was in the holiest of places, God's house. Jesus was not angry at buying and selling in and of themselves. He was angry that these things happened in a house of prayer. He never drove a money changer from a marketplace or from a bank. Jesus advises us to be of generous spirit, to show kindness, to assist the widow and the orphan. But he clearly means this to be our responsibility, not the government's. Consider Jesus' Good Samaritan story. A traveler comes upon a man at the side of a road. The man had been beaten and robbed and left half dead. What did the traveler, the Good Samaritan, do? He helps the unfortunate man on the spot with his own resources. Ask yourself, to help the poor, would Jesus prefer that you give your money freely to the Salvation Army, for example, or have it taxed by politicians to fund a welfare bureaucracy? Progressives like to point out that Jesus said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. But that has absolutely nothing to do with high taxes or wealth redistribution. It was the seed for the idea of separating church and state. It certainly wasn't the same as saying that whatever Caesar says is his must then be so, no matter how much he demands or what he intends to use it for. So there is no evidence that Jesus was a socialist, and there's lots of evidence that he supported free markets. In addition to the parable of the talents, Jesus offers his parable of the workers in the vineyard. In it, a landowner hires some laborers to pick grapes. Near the end of the day, he realizes he needs more workers to get the job done. To recruit them, he agrees to pay a full day's wage for just one hour of work, when one of the laborers who had worked an entire day complains, the landowner answers, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? 
That's a testament to the principles of supply and demand, of private property, and of voluntary contracts, not socialism. Jesus never endorsed the forced redistribution of wealth. That idea is rooted in envy, something that he and the Tenth of the Ten Commandments railed against. Most importantly, Jesus cared about helping the less fortunate. He never would have approved anything that undermines wealth creation. And the only thing that has ever created wealth and lifted masses of people out of poverty is free market capitalism. Read the New Testament. The plain meaning of the text is loud and clear. Jesus was not a socialist. He couldn't be. He loved people, not the state. I'm Lawrence Reed, president of the Foundation for Economic Education for Prager University. He was one of the most revered Americans of the 19th century. His story of personal triumph, humble origins to national prominence, is equal to or greater than that of Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, or Ulysses Grant. He never became a politician, but he spoke to presidents as an equal. His name is Frederick Douglass. Born a slave, Douglass never knew the exact date of his birth, never knew his father, never saw his mother after the age of seven. This wasn't uncommon at the time. Slave owners often made a point of separating families. Breaking family bonds increased dependence on the slave owner. Discipline was maintained through simple fear and destroying self-esteem. A slave could be punished for not working hard enough, but also for working too hard, or even for suggesting labor-saving ideas. Douglas experienced all of this and rebelled against it. As a teenager, he taught himself to read. This created a desire for freedom. When his owner discovered this disturbing development, he sent him to live with a local farmer, Edward Covey, who made extra money breaking the will of unruly slaves. Covey beat Douglas every week for six months, often for no reason. And it worked. Soon young Frederick gave up all hope of being free. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me, he later wrote. That all changed one hot August day in 1835. When Covey struck him, Douglas fought back. Where he found the courage, he couldn't say. The two men struggled until Covey stumbled away exhausted. Covey never laid a hand on Douglas again. The teenage slave had stood up for himself. He considered this the most important lesson of his life. Years later, he would tell this story when urging black men to enlist in the Union Army to fight the Confederacy. You owe it to yourself, he said. You will stand more erect and be less liable to insult. You will be defending your own liberty, honor, manhood, and self-respect. Douglas made his escape from slavery in 1838, slipping into the North disguised as a U.S. Navy sailor. At any point along the rail journey, his flimsy cover could have been blown. Displaying a confidence he didn't actually feel, he bluffed his way past suspicious conductors and runaway slave hunters. Once in the North, he joined the radical abolitionist movement and was quickly recognized as a powerful speaker and writer. The movement's leader, William Lloyd Garrison, burned the Constitution at his July 4th speeches. In Garrison's view, it legally protected slavery and was therefore irredeemable. But Douglas came to reject that. He believed that the Constitution was fundamentally opposed to slavery. Interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, Douglas said, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Not surprisingly, Douglas was a strong supporter of the Republican Party, the new anti-slavery party, and of the Union cause in the Civil War. Initially, he had his doubts about Abraham Lincoln. He didn't think Lincoln was truly committed to ending slavery. But he warmed up to the great emancipator as the conflict wore on. Lincoln, on the other hand, always admired Douglas. Here comes my friend Douglas, Lincoln said, when he saw him at his second inaugural in 1865. The Union victory ended slavery, but as the Democratic Party reestablished itself in the South in the 1870s and 80s, a new kind of racial oppression arose in the form of Jim Crow laws and, even worse, widespread lynching. This was a bitter pill for Douglas to swallow, but he never gave up the struggle and spent the last three decades of his life agitating for civil rights. Freedom, he was fond of saying, depended on three boxes, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. 
For Douglas, it was self-evident that black Americans as citizens were entitled to full freedom and full legal protection. At a speech in 1893, when white hecklers began booing him, Douglas set his speech aside and spoke extemporaneously. There is no Negro problem, he roared. The problem is whether the American people have honesty enough, loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution. He also believed that true liberty would only come for black Americans as it comes for anyone when they took full responsibility for their own fate. Ultimately, hard work and education would secure blacks the rights they deserved. There can be no independence without a large share of self-dependence. This virtue cannot be bestowed. It must be developed from within, he declared in his most popular lecture, appropriately titled Self-Made Men. Douglas defended equality and freedom until the day he died. Literally, he passed away in 1895 on his way to a political convention. He had well understood the deep prejudice that existed, but he never accepted it as an inherent part of American culture. My cause, he wrote, was and is that of the black man, not because he is black, but because he is a man. I'm Timothy Sandifer, author of Frederick Douglass, Self-Made Man, for Prager University. Napoleon Bonaparte was the most famous man of the 19th century. At the peak of his power, he personally controlled more of the European continent than anyone since the great emperors of Rome. Today, most people see him as an ambitious little man with an outsized ego. Others see him as a forerunner of the great aggressor of the 20th century, Adolf Hitler. This portrait is as flawed as it is unfair. Napoleon Bonaparte was born on the 15th of August, 1769, on the Mediterranean island of Corsica. Ironically, the island, long connected to the city-state of Genoa, Italy, only became part of France the year before he was born. But for this twist of fate, Napoleon would never have been a French citizen, let alone its emperor. His parents sent him to the mainland at the age of nine, where he studied to be a soldier. His facility in mathematics, organization, and map reading marked him for future success. The French Revolution, with its overworked guillotine, provided a unique opportunity for advancement, that is, for anyone who could keep his head, literally. Napoleon did. He became a general by the age of 24. At the age of 26, he achieved a series of stunning victories in Italy against an Austrian army that had come to destroy the revolution and return the French royal family, the Bourbons, to the throne. These victories made him a national hero. As shrewd a politician as he was a general, by the first month of the new century, at the tender age of 30, Napoleon was the undisputed leader of France. He crowned himself emperor on December the 2nd, 1804, turning the French Republic into the French Empire with a Bonaparte line of succession. Napoleon's establishment of a French Empire only increased the fears of the royal houses of Europe and of France's historical enemy, Britain. As a result, in September 1805, Austria invaded Bavaria, a French ally, and Russia joined the attack. Napoleon and his Grande Armée roundly defeated them at the Battle of Austerlitz. The Prussians were the next to test Napoleon, declaring war on him in 1806. The Austrians tried again in 1809. Napoleon didn't start any of these wars, but he won them all. When Russia broke an uneasy peace in 1812, Napoleon decided to invade. But this proved his undoing. His catastrophic winter retreat from Moscow cost him more than half a million casualties. The end came in June 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, where the combined European armies, led by the Duke of Wellington, decisively defeated Napoleon's forces. The battle could have gone either way. Wellington himself described it as the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. In all, Napoleon won 46 of the 60 battles he fought, drawing seven and losing seven. His record clearly marks him as one of the greatest military commanders of all time. Yet, 
While Napoleon is best remembered for his military exploits, it's his political reforms, both inside and outside of France, that had the most lasting effect. In France, he established the Code Napoleon, a distillation of 42 competing and often contradictory legal codes into a single body of French law. He modernized the French educational system and created the Sorbonne, which became one of the great universities of Europe. He promoted a building boom in Paris, a city whose architecture continues to enchant us. The bridges he built across the Seine and the sewer system he constructed beneath the city still function today. To Europe, Napoleon brought the best fruits of the French Revolution, concepts of equality and meritocracy. He liberated the Jews from the ghettos to which they had been confined for centuries, leading to an explosion of artistic, scientific, and economic innovation from this long-oppressed minority. It's hard to assess Napoleon because he was responsible for all these good things while also being responsible for much that was bad. But we can say this with certainty. To compare him to the murderous, oppressive dictators of the 20th century, like Hitler and Stalin, or their tin pot versions like Saddam Hussein or Colonel Gaddafi, is a gross injustice. Napoleon was sui generis, unique unto himself, and proof positive that one man, given the right circumstances, can change history. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. Life isn't fair. And you know what? It can't be. Here's the problem. The word fair doesn't mean justice or equity or indeed anything very specific. Instead, it's become a sort of all-purpose statement of moral superiority. Superiority tinged paradoxically with victimhood. Now, fairness does have an exact meaning in certain contexts. For example, if we're playing a game, fairness means that the rules should be applied impartially. When we're kids and our parents and teachers set the rules, the word still has that essential meaning. It's a young person's way of demanding what we might call equality before the law. But as we get older, the word becomes more of a whine. In the mouth of a teenager, trust me on this, it's not fair means, more often than not, you won't let me do something I want. In recent years, though, something odd has happened. Adults have started using the word in much the same way that teenagers do. More than in any previous generation, people today retain their teenage sense of self-centeredness. They use it's not fair as a catch-all complaint, as an assertion of wounded entitlement. Look at a Google graph of the use of the word fairness. From around 1965, it looks like the proverbial hockey stick. Flat, and then it suddenly shoots up. We've developed a fairness obsession. But what do we mean when we use the word? Do we mean justice? Do we mean equality? Do we mean need? Or do we mean something else? Suppose you and Jane buy a cake together. You pay $6 and Jane pays $4. What would be the fair way to split it up? You could do it on the basis of proportionality. In other words, you get 60% of the cake and Jane gets 40%. Or you could do it on the basis of strict egalitarianism, half each regardless of who paid what. Or you could do it on the basis of wealth. Jane has much less money than you for non-essentials like cake, so maybe she should get the larger share. A case can be made for each approach. But the beauty of the word fair is that it doesn't require you to come down clearly in favour of any of them. It gives you the cover of ambiguity. So, for example, when a politician says, we want the rich to pay their fair share, he doesn't usually mean that he wants the rich to pay taxes at the same rate as everyone else. He means that he wants them to pay extra. The word fair lets him present higher rates of taxation as a form of justice. But only if we don't think about it too hard. That's the beauty of it. Fair doesn't ultimately mean proportionate or impartial or equal. You can use it to mean almost any positive thing you like. 
I want fairness generally means look at me, I'm a nice person. Demanding fairness lets you tell the world how decent you are without your actually having to contribute a penny. It's a kind of vanity. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Let's get real. The only way to distribute the cake is to see how much people are prepared to pay for their slice. Sure, that could leave a banker with a bigger slice than a baker. Sure, we might not like that distribution. We might feel that the baker is doing something more valuable than the banker. He's making delicious pastries while the money man doesn't seem to be making anything except money for himself. But how can we judge someone else's economic worth? You might want bakers to be paid more than bankers. I might want teachers to be paid more than movie stars. Since we all have our own preferences, the only way to measure the economic value of a service is to see how much others are prepared to pay for it. That's what the market does. It aggregates our preferences. It doesn't ask us in the abstract what we think someone else deserves. It tests in reality how many hours of our own labour we're prepared to put in in exchange for a product or a service. Under every other economic system, our relations are mediated by Accidents of birth and social caste and financial rewards are determined by favoritism. The free market alone gives everyone the same rights. My money is as good as yours. You can't get fairer than that. I'm Daniel Hannan, President of the Initiative for Free Trade and author of Inventing Freedom for Prager University. There are only two things I can tell you today that come with absolutely no agenda. The first is congratulations. The second is good luck. Everything else is what I like to call the dirty oh, truth, which is just another way of saying it's my opinion. And in my opinion, you have all been given some terrible advice. And that advice is this, follow your passion. Every time I watch the Oscars, I cringe when some famous movie star, trophy in hand, starts to deconstruct the secret of their success. It's always the same thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have what it takes, kid. And the ever popular, never give up on your dreams. Look, I understand the importance of persistence and the value of encouragement, but who tells a stranger to never give up on their dreams without even knowing what it is they're dreaming? I mean, how can Lady Gaga possibly know where your passion will lead you? Have these people never seen American Idol? Year after year, thousands of aspiring American idols show up with great expectations only to learn that they don't possess the skills they thought they did. What's really amazing, though, is not their lack of talent. The world's full of people who can't sing. It's their genuine shock at being rejected. The incredible realization that their passion and their ability had nothing to do with each other. Look, if we're talking about your hobby, by all means, let your passion lead you. But when it comes to making a living, it's easy to forget the dirty truth. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you won't suck at it. And just because you've earned a degree in your chosen field, it doesn't mean you're going to find your dream job. Dream jobs are usually just that, dreams. But their imaginary existence just might keep you from exploring careers that offer a legitimate chance to perform meaningful work and develop a genuine passion for the job you already have. Because here's another dirty truth. Your happiness on the job has very little to do with the work itself. On Dirty Jobs, I remember a very successful septic tank cleaner, a multimillionaire who told me the secret to his success. I looked around to see where everyone else was headed, he said, and then I went the opposite way. Then I got good at my work. Then I began to prosper, and then one day I realized I was passionate about other people's crap. I've heard that same basic story from welders, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, HVAC professionals, hundreds of other skilled tradesmen who followed opportunity, not passion, and prospered as a result. Consider the reality of the current job market. Right now, Millions of people with degrees and diplomas are out there competing for a relatively narrow set of opportunities that polite society calls good careers. 
Now, meanwhile, employers are struggling to fill nearly 5.8 million jobs that nobody's trained to do. This is the skills gap. It's real, and its cause is actually very simple. When people follow their passion, they miss out on all kinds of opportunities they didn't even know existed. When I was 16, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. He was a skilled tradesman, could build a house without a blueprint. That was my passion, and I followed it for years. I took all the shop classes at school. I did all I could to absorb the knowledge and skill that came so easily to my granddad. Unfortunately, the handy gene is recessive. It skipped right over me, and I struggled mightily to overcome my deficiencies, but I couldn't. Uh. I was one of those contestants on American Idol who believed his passion was enough to ensure his success. One day, I brought home a sconce I had made in wood shop. It looked like a paramecium. After a heavy sigh, my granddad gave me the best advice I've ever received. He told me, Mike, you can still be a tradesman, but only if you get yourself a different kind of toolbox. At the time, this felt contrary to everything I believed about the importance of passion and persistence and staying the course. But of course he was right, because staying the course, that only makes sense if you're headed in a sensible direction. And while passion is way too important to be without, it is way too fickle to follow around. Which brings us to the final dirty truth. Never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Congratulations again, and good luck. I'm Mike Rowe from MicroWorks for Prager University. I'm always telling my daughter stories from when I was a kid. By comparison, the world of my youth was rougher and meaner than the world that kids grow up in today. So here's my question. Did this rougher and meaner world better prepare me to be a well-adjusted, happy adult? I say yes. When I was a kid, you could say we were less sensitive about a lot of things. I mean, just look at the commercials we watched. We had the Frito Bandito, the cartoon spokesman for Fritos. He was a three and a half foot tall Mexican thief. Can you imagine pitching that at an ad agency today? Uh-huh, the uh, Frito Bandito, okay. Um, all right, Phil, you don't work here anymore. Yeah, you gotta go clean out your desk right now. Some were violent. Hawaiian Punch, every commercial was the same. A cartoon Hawaiian character walks up to an unsuspecting cartoon tourist and says, hey, how about a nice Hawaiian punch? Sure, says the tourist, which gets him punched directly in the face. We all thought that was hilarious. Kids had to be tougher then too. An occasional playground fight was expected. And as for teasing, my mom had a remedy for that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. She used to say that all the time. One of the seemingly endless adages she had at her disposal to deal with any of life's problems. But I think long and hard about the practical applications that statement had on my life. That's true, I thought. If someone punches you in the chest, it hurts no matter what. But with words, it all depends on how you think about it. You could actually choose whether or not to be hurt. You can't choose whether or not a punch hurts, but you can choose whether or not words hurt. That was huge. Even though it had been repeated ad nauseum for generations, sticks and stones really was a powerful bit of philosophy to a kid. That's one of the great things about being a parent. You can spout cliches till the cows come home, and yet, to your child, it's all new. You come off as one of the great thinkers in Western culture. But does anyone really say sticks and stones anymore? I doubt there's a grammar school teacher today who's even allowed to utter that phrase. They're much more likely to warn against the ever-present danger of hate speech or triggers or hurting people's feelings. This is done in the name of teaching children to respect each other. It begins innocently enough by trying to eradicate teasing, but it continues into middle and high school where there's no greater sin than offending someone's personal or cultural sensitivity. We've seen what used to be called great books banned because of fear of offending. That would not have even occurred to us years ago. Of course, 
How could the physical abuse in The Great Gatsby harm us in high school when we spent our childhood watching Jerry the Mouse staple gun Tom the Cat's tongue to the wall? How could reading an honest depiction of racial attitudes in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn harm us when we sang ay 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 along with the Frito Bandito? Or fat kids, skinny kids, kids who climb on rocks, tough kids, sissy kids. They said sissy kids. Even kids with chicken pox, we sang that along with the Armor Hot Dog Kids on our TV sets. Now people look back and some feel ashamed that teasing was expected in childhood. And stereotypes were commonplace in our culture. But was growing up in that environment worse than the hypersensitive culture we live in now? I look at the rough and tumble of childhood and the process of learning to deal with bullying and being insulted as a process of inoculation. After each instance of being offended and then repeating my mother's sticks and stones philosophy, it was like a vaccine that built up my immune system. Eventually, you're resistant. And often, you weren't even aware it was happening. I can't imagine my college-age self living in fear of microaggressions. Yet today, there are full-time campus administrators whose job involves scrubbing the campus curriculum and social life of anything that might offend anyone. And these are college students, ostensible adults, headed into the job market. I don't want to offend anyone with a microaggression if they're holding a scalpel. I try to laugh it off. I don't want my outrage to match theirs. The best thing I can do is tell my stories to my kids and remind them that sticks and stones may break their bones, but names will never hurt them. They think I wrote it. I'm Tom Shalou for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.